What's up, guys? It is Modern Craftsman Monday. 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 <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't believe people love that. I know. But we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. This week, we got Wade Wheeler. He is a uh, general contractor, but also turned business coach when he basically lost everything in 2008, 2009. Uh, that's a big move to basically lose everything and decide I'm going to tell everyone how to run their business now. But we get into none of that. We 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 go down. I mean, a rabbit hole. That would have been the do. easy route to take, you know. If we you basically to, avo- you actively call? avoided it. Yeah. For three hours. It's a good one. Yeah, it was fun. It was nice. Guys, it wasn't like a standard business podcast. And I think it'll it'll speak to a lot of people that you know may, might be ignoring their finances that this might feel make you feel a little bit more comfortable that you're not the only person and it is important to your business i mean it's Absolutely. mandatory it is mandatory metallica <laughs> well i'm speaking yeah. of which mike Rowe. um he follows 12 people one of them is metallica that's amazing <laughs> really? yeah <laughs> So let's let everyone DM Metallica and Mike yeah. Rowe. Metallica will Monty definitely Carson. get a hold of Mike Rowe for us. <laughs> that would be the most amazing introduction. Yeah. So if, if anyone Metallica knows Metallica, Metallica let's just let's start there. Does anyone know Metallica? Reach out to us. Become part of the Modern Craftsman Nation. We we'll yeah, get Mike Rowe on. No James we'll Hetfield, do a special. Give us a call. Dude, we'll do two episodes a week if we get Metallica. Yeah. Done. Yeah. For sure. That's incentive. Guys, this podcast is brought to you by duration molding and millwork imagine siding a dormer any time of the year without the need for sealing any of the field cut edges or using materials to hold the siding off the roofing material that's just one example of what you can do with duration beveled siding time savings unmatched durability and great looks to learn more about duration poly ash products please visit their all new website at durationmillwork.com Well, Nick, you and I have talked to each other. Um, Johnny, you definitely look like the most of the builders within this group because you're background right now. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a green screen. It's a <laughs> perfect, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, I'm Tyler. You guys tell me roll. When we're going, we're going. Yeah, we're going. We just roll right into it. So I don't know if you, uh, you know John. Do you, do you know Tyler as well? No, I've not met either one of these guys. Um, Nick, you're the only one that I've ever talked to. Um, You know, did do read your guys' bio real quick on your podcast website. That's about as much as I know. That's about it. That's like, that's our life in a nutshell, I think, in there. What does it say about us? Um, That you're all good builders. Okay. That's that's (laughs) basically what I I take away from it. All lies, then. Oh, hey, you know, it, uh, no, it, it, it just quick bios and uh, that's as much as I know. So, you Fair know, enough. appreciate you having me on. I'm uh, looking forward to this and, uh, you know, looking forward to the talk for sure. Wait, yeah, are you in the bathroom right now? That's what it kind of looks like. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. Good. This is, this is, this is the back of my office, but it does uh, I actually a little spritzer. <laughs> you know, I do have a little spritzer here. It's got like here, the mirror. So. It looks like you're just sitting. I can see the, uh, the uh, fan a, up there. That's a reflection. <laughs> We're having, uh, abnormally warm weather with fires so if you guys see me rub my eyes it uh we've had horrible forest fires this year and the smoke's coming right down to me where are you located Um, we're in colorado a little place called and we have i've been there i think we've we've burned about five hundred thousand acres so far this year wow and it's uh it's just not stopping we've got one that's about 120,000 acres maybe 30 miles away from us and every couple my ignorance right down so is Again, it uh you see is me it rub my eyes that's that's what i'm doing is that close enough to freak out no like... not really um they're just huge it's just big plumes of smoke and comes down through the foothills and just doesn't seem to go away i mean it's 85 degrees here today which is not right you know it wow. should be much cooler and, and uh, we should start thinking about uh, you know the fall and winter weather but uh I'm guaranteed of a winter because we're trying to push to get a foundation in before the snow comes. So I can guarantee we'll get some snow. Hmm. So forgive my ignorance. Is that is, you know, the fires, is it normal? Like, is it, I know we spoke to, uh, we got some guys in Northern California where it's like, he was saying every four years, 
uh, they were experiencing it, and now it's it seems to be every year. But for, what about for you guys up in Colorado? We haven't had anything in a couple of years, but it's been an abnormally dry winter mm. or dry summer. No, we didn't have the thunderstorms. We didn't have anything like that, and just the dryness. Uh, we've had. I think we've broken the top uh, scale of fire twice this year. Um, wow. So. It's been a, a very heavy year. I mean, every year we get one or two, right? I've sure. seen a few from my house. Um, I saw one from my house this year, but these are big. I mean, these things are red flag warning winds and 100,000 acres plus a piece. So abnormal, I would say overall. And I know I'm not the only one because I've never experienced anything like that. But I can't even imagine being at my house and seeing a fire. Like, I feel like if I saw a fire down the street i'd leave yeah never <laughs> like never mind it can be a little unnerving but uh you know it's also uh, the, the one fire we had up towards evergreen this year my wife and i sat on the back deck and i had a beer and she had a glass of wine and we just watched the planes come in and take care of it so it can be entertaining that's at the same time. but you know not a lot of structures like they get in california out here mm -hmm. uh these are free floating forest fires. I mean, a few structures here and there, but you know, California, they get a forest fire, it takes out a fire. But uh, anyway, but, uh, it, it's been an abnormal year for sure. sure. Well, for those that uh, don't know you, what's your background? And I know you and I have chatted, you have a, a construction company, but also a consulting company. What's, you know, Correct. I'd love to unfold that both of those. Okay, so yeah, I'll give you I'll give you the quick nickel tour. Um, twenty five years plus thirty years in, in the building industry. Um, you know, I've started humping lumber from my uncle in high school, and uh, have done everything in a house at one one point or another. Um, over the years, you know, built in in California, built in Austin, Texas, and, and built out here, Lake Tahoe, primarily custom homes. Uh, very high-end custom homes is is what I've done. Uh, do some light commercial things like that, but uh, done it all. You know, <laughs> just I've done it all. And the uh, the short story on the consulting company was based out of necessity. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but that really fun housing crash in two thousand nine. Uh, but we got to go through. You know, I was building a exceptionally large house uh it had a budget just north of about 10 million so it was it was a big custom home and we went from that finishing that project to i literally could get, not get a bathroom job you know it was we all have the ups and downs you know the the markets do this and we're used to those and those of us who've been in business for a long time kind of scale those and, and watch out but that one just really you know, we, I lost it all. I lost the ranch. I lost the business. I lost everything. I was uh, one of those guys that did not cl declare bankruptcy, but paid everybody back and, uh, you know, wanted to keep going. So what I did is once I got the company kind of back under control, I realized there was a lot of other guys out there struggling. And this was more than just a market adjustment. This was a major thing for a lot of guys. So I developed a consulting company uh, to help guys utilize technology and to downscale their companies and uh, but keep themselves alive, you know, keep their families fed. And from there, I've, you know, been consulting over the years and uh, the consulting company seems to be coming more and more into, into the light, I think, especially with the last six or you know seven months however long all this craziness has been um you know getting things back. and that's originally nick how you and i talked the first time um was through that so there's there's the nickel tour uh old school builder old school builder where did you say that you grew up i grew up in northern california and central california and then you so, were you were in, you started in uh, or you were building in Austin for a little bit. You said was building in Austin as well, and you know I've always been in the building trades, Tyler. Um, I did have a company at one point. I developed a nationwide franchise 
for garage renovations. Uh, back in the early 2000s, renovating your garage was a really hot topic, right? I'm doing one we, right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had, I think I had uh, 50 plus dealers in 28 different states. Um, and we had a distribution facility in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and one in Las Vegas, and we needed one kind of in the middle of the country. So that's what brought me out to Austin originally. And then uh, sold out that and went back into custom building right after that. So there's a little bit more of the story. And how did you end up in Colorado? Ended up, my wife was born here in Colorado and we had a decision. I actually, in between Austin and Colorado, I did a custom home in a place called Rancho Santa Fe, which is in Southern California, uh, restoring or rebuilding a house actually, speaking of fires again, uh, there was a, there's a, a really beautiful community out there. It's just inland from Del Mar and uh, San Diego area. And we had to build a house that was designed by a gal named Lillian Rice back in the 20s. And she was an architect, um, very famous architect in California, but the interior of the home was going to be ultra modern. So did that, did, did that project. And then we had a choice, do we go back to Texas or where do we go? And my wife said, I'm from Colorado. So why don't we just come out here? Nice. And, uh, been here for about uh, 11 years. Just been all sunshine since then, right? All you know how it is. It's all sunshine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's crazy. All, it's all like sunshine. eighty-five degree day is not that abnormal for you guys. No, it's not. It's not. But uh, yeah, I've been here for eleven years, and uh, the con- the construction company I've kept small. Er, I would say. Um, What's just, smaller? Just to, uh, try to do just a couple houses at a time, uh, and and not create things that are too big. Although this year, you know, we thought, hey, maybe we'll expand a little bit. And uh, we've decided just to stay a little bit smaller, but uh, try to do the consulting as much as I can. Nice. As well. I'm going to try to leave no stone unturned. How big was that house in 2008, 2009? You said 10 million. Yeah, but okay. Size, that that was about 21,000 square feet air conditioned. Wow. But it also had 9,000 square feet of tile deck on the outside. Uh, it was, I don't show it very often, like in my advertising and things, because it's not really, it was not necessarily the it's style really what you want to stick what with. You, what you want to uh, build right now. <laughs> it was very Italian. Think uh, yeah. big Corinthian columns and gold plated sinks and Spanish creme de marfil all throughout. I mean, it had three swimming pools, a church, a tennis court. It was just over the top. It was over the top. Jeez. Um, it uh, so that it was it was a gigantic house on three and a half acres. It was a so, big one. So so Wade, when you were doing yeah. that one project, what was the setup of the company at that point? Like, did you have anything else going on? I know. Oh, oh gosh, oh, wait, no. crushed everybody. But what was kind of the? No, uh, just that one project. I mean, that was you know three and a half years building that project. So with something of that scale, um, you know, I'd have forty five guys on site sometimes oh as far as subcontractors and things like that so there was no room to do anything else that's why when we finished it uh there was i you know i didn't have anything else really lined up and I mean, then, you, you've spoken to nick i mean yep. to say that that's all you can do is tough you know one 10 million dollar project nick would do like yeah. that <laughs> and like six other things <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm sure show. i would sure, sure exactly exactly <laughs> but no we was it was just just that one project at the time. I, I guess looking back at that, right? Looking back in, you know, let's go all the way back to when you sold that job. So three and a half years prior to that, when what was your company structured like before you did that? Were you, were you incrementally working up towards these 20 plus thousand square foot homes or was this like a, you know, just something that just showed up one day? No, I mean, you know, I, I was lucky learning the construction trade. My uncle uh, was a guy by the name of Rich Tincher, and he owns Tincher Construction or owned Tincher Construction. He's, he's retired since um, in Northern California. And I was kind of birthed into nice, big, giant houses. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done it all. I mean, I've done, you know, decks, 
obviously coming out of, of college and things, I didn't jump right into that. You know, I was working with a tool belt and doing whatever I could, but it was, it was not a tough transition to get back into there. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I've learned is it's just more zeros. I know that sounds slightly callous to say, but sure. it's the truth. I mean, whether, you know, you're doing a remodel for somebody for $200,000 and to them $200,000 is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, or you have somebody that has a little bit higher net worth, the headaches are the same. You know, yeah, when you say it, there's more zeros, it's across the board. It's it's more zeros on the sale, but it's also more zeros on the, the, the cost. Exactly right. Exactly. Right. And, and, and the, it's just scalable. I mean, that's one of the beauties of construction is whether you're doing a bathroom or you're doing a large house, it's, ju it's, it's really the same process. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just a, a scalable you know, how do you, how do you scale it? Working on a project for three and a half years, what, you know, what was the, what was the mindset or what was, you know, basically comforting you saying that I don't need to take on another project right now? What, you know, was there like, wh I guess the stability behind it, like we, we get asked the question all the time. It's like, you know, how do we know if these clients have the money to fund this project or not? Yeah, you know, I, I guess at the time I didn't really think about it. And it, it, as far as, you know, forecasting what was coming next, guys, I mean, it, it, you know, as we're getting towards the end of the project, I had other things that were coming down the pipe, right? I mean, that's, we, we're, all, we're always working ourselves out of a job, right? That's, that's part of our, our industry. So I had other things coming, but when the market crashed, those did not come to fruition. And, you know, then there was nothing else. But it, so, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just concentrating on that one thing. And then when it was done, I'd figure out what I was doing next. So you were by yourself? It was just you? Was, did you have anybody? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had other guys. Yeah, I had other, you know, project foremen um, and people in the office and, and doing the billing and, and things like that. But it was primarily me. You know, it was just primarily me and a, and a whole team of subcontractors. And I did have a, a group of guys that would work with me as the, you know, do the between trades things that we always have to do, you know, rock moving and, and other little projects that were in there. And they, they were hired on full time. But as far as a managerial standpoint, um, besides an accountant and just, you know, project manager kind of helping me who was, you know, mid rank sort of thing, it was, it was just me. Damn. So going in, you know, coming out of that, hitting the, the 2008, you know, not being able to get work, you know, what was that period of time between when you finished that project? Well, did, I guess the first question is, did you finish the project? We did finish the project. You did. Yeah, yeah. we did. We did finish the project. Uh, we finished it and then he ended up selling it right afterwards. And I think he did okay. I mean, every economic downturn, it doesn't affect everybody. The, move, the money just shifts from one group to another, right? I exactly. mean, I know there was a lot of money to be made in that, uh, that housing crash, especially if you had cash on hand, right? You know, There's a lot of people bought land and that's actually one of the people that backed out of the next project I was going to do. That's what they said. They said, why would I build something right now? I'm going to use this money to go buy stuff cheap. And I'm sure they've done very well since. I feel like that's pretty standard, even when everything tanked temporarily, or it's like, if you have money on hand, buy stock. Um, Absolutely. or <clears throat> if the property values go down, you can invest in that stuff. Cause you know, it's going to eventually come back up, but you got to make sure that you're liquid enough and have enough on the back end to carry through however long that's going to last, which is obviously uncertain. Yeah. It, it, it different times and it goes up and down and yeah, well said, well said. How, how long between, you know, finishing that project was it before you started another? Uh, well, like I said, I went out to Southern California um, and did this one in Rancho Santa Fe um, soon after, and that was just through a connection, jumped out and did that and had some good fun, got back on the surfboard for a while and, uh, you know, had some fun out there, but did realize that, that was not the place, you know, for me and my family long term. Mm -hmm. But then, um, you know, the consulting thing I did for a couple of years, just exclusively and just concentrated on that. and you know, did seminars and uh, would go into you know, anywhere from small companies to, you know, medium sized companies. And 
then got hired on a little bit longer full time to help you know consult and, and run a group and funny enough that group had nothing to do with construction it was uh lasers <laughs> of all things out of milan italy it's just interesting you know how the paths take sure. you down the road right uh, but uh was still doing you know some smaller projects and things like that and then uh, about five or six years ago um partnered up with my my partner mike out here with domus builders and uh, been it just you know concentrating a little bit more on that until this year and coming back into the consulting. I guess that's the that, that that's my my question is you know between when you you know essentially moved to Southern California be, out of necessity to take on another project to keep the steady income and then going into consulting like that what that time frame is because I feel like you know I, I'm for me i'm trying to put myself in that position where it's like all right you know things aren't shaking out the way i had intended them to you know i'm trying to make my business survive i'm moving hours away from where you know i i currently live into another state uh and then on top of that let's launch a consulting company to help people go you know help people prevent this exact scenario and it's like and 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 I guess in doing that, you you have there's a lot that has to happen. I think mentally, where it's you need to go through that entire process and understand where you went wrong, so then you can share or help guide people not to make that mistake or the many mistakes that led to, you know, the the position that you might be in. Right. Yeah. I mean, it uh, a lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time is definitely. A lot, a lot of brain power for sure. A lot of brain power for sure. But I mean, you know, there, there were some smaller projects here and there and I was always kind of doing it, you know, a, a, years ago, somebody told me, look in construction, the, the beauty of construction, whether you're big or you're small, as long as you can put a tool belt on and smack a hammer, you'll always have work. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll always always be able to do something it may not be glamorous it may not be what you want to do that day but you always have something to do it's 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 funny you say that i was told you know there's working and then there's making busy right you can always make yourself busy but if you're actually are you actually making money during those moments because like people always say well i work crazy hours and it's like but do you yeah Dude. right yeah, yeah right do you like, really like, work it yeah. like no one's ever said to tyler i don't believe you're putting the hours in or, or nick or anybody but like there's a lot of guys and girls out there that that want to preach that they're part of that kind of you know dirty hands movement you know yeah, clean yeah. money and it's they, they just don't put that in you know so it, it and i was one of those people forever i'll work saturdays i'll, I'll put the effort in and was i actually working on saturday you know, was I really getting a productive day out of it? But I think that while that's true at the same time, like starting up, you can't lose sight of the fact that you do have to put in all of that extra sweat equity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that like you yourself have to invest in that company before anyone else does. And then I think you should be able to get to a point where you can back off a little bit and that's not to say that there's not crazy times and times you know we all work a lot but it shouldn't if you're doing things the right way it shouldn't be seven days a week 52 weeks a year um i mean unless that's just what you want to be doing with your life you're you're probably not structuring things correctly if you can't take any time off the way that you've structured your business yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, at the same time, I think the maintenance of the people that work for us, uh, if you end up slacking off or seemingly slack off, they'll do the same very quickly. Uh, they always follow the lead, right? right. Yeah, everybody's always going to follow the guy and who, who's leading. So I think we always need to stay busy in it. But Tyler, to your what you just said right there, Definitely, I mean, through experience comes working smarter, not harder. Um, Intelligently approached, I mean, we can accomplish the same thing without, you know, busting our brains out trying to get it done. Uh, It's working smarter, not harder. And that's, you know, 
systems and protocols and repeatable things that you can do within the company, things that you can teach to people that are repeatable. Uh, but always, you got to stay in the game. You know, gotta, I think you always have always have to stay in the game. That's it's easier said than done. Yeah, I think it's also tough where it's like you make the comment about you can you know if you can put a tool belt on and hit a hammer or, or swing a hammer and hit a nail, it's like you can make money. But you know, there's that while that's true, it's like, but at the same time, that is m- probably more true for a smaller company or a one man show, where it's like you're producing right, where you know the you know. For, for me, example, it's like if we got slow, me putting a tool belt on doesn't solve the problem. It would it would allow me to survive, but the company might not. And, and, and I agree. I mean, if you, if you have, it's not the best use of your time. I mean, it once again, you know, you have to lead. Right. And, and somebody has to tell another guy where, where to go to swing the hammer. They, they won't know what to do or, or how to do it. But I think the analogy could be used for adjustability. And, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I've seen it. It's changed a little bit out there compared to what I thought was going to be happening in January of 2020, right? Mm-hmm. It's changed, but in a weird way, it, it hasn't changed the way it did in 2009. It, in many ways, there's a lot more opportunities to grab. So if we use the swing a hammer and, and, you know, hit a nail sort of analogy. I mean, a lot of guys that I'm talking to right now and and working with and and myself included was what I look at, was looking at or planning on in January of 2020, the correct path to continue on right now. And I mean, we're, we're seeing changes in the market. Um, where people are moving around all over the place. They're thinking that if they go somewhere else, it's going to be better. You have a whole other other group of people that are saying, okay, I'm not going to buy and sell houses anymore. I want to renovate the one that I'm in because this is good enough and I think this is okay. Uh, So that that same analogy can be there of you can always swing a hammer and hit a nail. Sure. It's more about adjusting the business and continually, you know, my, my philosophy that I use a lot is refine and flow. Um, you just, you want to refine things, let it flow for a while, see what ends up happening, refine it, let it flow for a while again. Okay. That worked. That didn't work. 80% of it worked. 20% didn't throw the 20% out. Let's keep going. Let's keep moving forward. Um, continually adjust, continually. I think adjust. They did, it is true. You need to give yourself if you're constantly making changes without giving yourself enough time to really put those things into a pl- into place and then inventory and kind of quantify what those changes did that you'll never really get your get your finger on the pulse of what's going on because you're just constantly evolving and you don't know what works and what doesn't work you're just trying to make everything work agreed and over evolution over growth i mean these are I mean, you, you guys know it's the quickest way to wreck a company is grow too fast. I mean, absolutely. You know, too much infrastructure, moving too fast. Um, it, it's it's that fine line in between. And, what about moving that. too slow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it can happen. I mean, you know, there's there's plenty of work out there. There's plenty of ways to make money. Uh, but, there's, you know, if, if we were all completely and 100% primarily financially driven, we wouldn't be in this industry, right? right? It's, we want to do something cool first. We want to build cool stuff first, right? That's, there's, a, there's an old analogy of, um, you know, greed and, and knowledge. And if you chase knowledge, you know, the, the money follows it. But if you chase the greed, you'll never gain the knowledge. And, you know, and this, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on this, Tyler, where my philosophy comes from in this. Because when, you know, when I go into a company or I start talking to people about what's going on with their business, the systems and protocols are easy, right? They're, they're easy to jump into. 
quick to see, okay, why are you doing this? You're double doing work. Why are you doing that? Uh, the finances in particular, um, you know, you can go in and look at the numbers and do, you know, the number crunching and see what's there. But the, the real thing is, is the culture of the company. And, you know, the people that I work with, I have a series of questions that I ask to see if I'm going to be a good fit, you know, to help out. And some of the main things are, you know, what are you motivated by? And if the first thing is, is money, it's okay, well, that's probably, that's not the approach that I would take. It's, it's, you know, creating an, an amazing thing, meaning a, a building company or, or whatever company that create, that makes cool stuff and, and treats their employees well. You know, I'm always a big fan of Richard Branson, who his whole philosophy is not customer first, it's employees first. Because if you take care of the employees, they take care of the customers. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the primary thing. So again, going into a business, it's easy to see the processes, the procedures, the protocols, those are easy to manipulate. Once you get those into place, you get a good accountant. And Nick and I actually, I'll give a shout out to Nicole Landau. Nick and I have a fantastic accountant and that's how we originally met. And, you know, once you get those things into place, you don't need to adjust them too much is, is you were saying, you know, over adjusting, over adjusting, don't, don't adjust things that are working. It's there's day to day problems that happen. And those, those need the continual adjustment. There's employees and, and you know, product not showing up, guys not coming in, et cetera. What I, I want to go back to your comment about growing too fast. Hmm. Because I, I'd like to understand <laughs> <laughs> your definition of growing too fast. But does it matter? Asking, asking if, for if it's friend. sustainable. If it's and, and I'll say not growing too fast. Let me let me change the verbiage of that. You can say growing too fast. I, That's growing, all right. Growing me, too much. Let me let me. I'm gonna pause for a second. I yeah. I ask because you know obviously like we've talked on the podcast. You know we I think even last last part last episode we talked about my growth and how I, you know i hired a lot of people at a time and i'm i'm looking to continue to grow and and many will say that i'm growing extremely fast uh in some ways i agree with that but in other in and when you make a comment that you can't grow too fast you know i know that's not necessarily directed to me and i feel like there's other people that are listening that probably are in a similar position where but it does make me trigger and think like, all right, am I, is it directed to me or what, you know, what is that threshold of, all right, this is too fast and this is really, this is, you know, as fast as you can go. So I guess like, what, what is your definition? What do you, like, how do you explain that? Yeah. And, and again, I think when I was, you know, changing the verbiage in the direction we're going right now, it's not growing too fast. It's growing in an unsustainable rate that your processes and procedures can't keep up with the growth that's going on. If one of the people that you're putting into place that is in charge of something that's vital to the company, what happens if, if they get hit by a bus, right? And, sure. and all of a sudden, then that whole section of the company can't be sustained anymore. It, it, it's finances. I mean, the upside down pyramid is, is, is a very classic term for you, you have way too much management at the top and the processes aren't keeping up down below. Um, I was actually reading a, an article. I have this old BSA motorcycle that I'm fixing up right now, right? It's just, and so I was reading about the BSA motorcycle company, which was the top company in the 60s. Like if you want a cool motorbike, you're going to ride a BSA. Their product was amazing. What they put out was amazing but their company developed into an upside down pyramid to where they were management heavy and not process heavy. And that's what I see a lot. Guys, go, I'm gonna hire people all over the place. I'm gonna get managers. Oh, he's got it. He's gonna take care of it. Well, is he gonna take care of it? And is he gonna take care of it the way that you envision 
he's going to take care of it because ultimately, I mean, it's your, it's your company. It has to, it has to have your vibe to it. It has to have your energy to it. Otherwise people are going to be going out and doing business under your name in a fashion that you don't want to. And uh, so that, that's what I mean by growing too much. It's bigger is not always better. I mean, I've learned that lesson, you know, in that example we used in 09. And uh, continually, that's a, that's a tough one, especially for guys and gals that are, that are motivated, right? We're all motivated. We want, we want to do more, we want to do more, we want to do more. Uh, and sometimes it's good to just take a step back. You refine it, you grow it, you got to flow a little bit and just make sure it's working. So that next step comes and, and you don't get over leveraged and upside down pyramid and fall over. But looking back to 09, you know, maybe it's naive for me to say this, but if you did have more people and you had this, you were, you were doing this $10 million renovation, but you were also doing smaller renovations or the bathrooms and, and had, you know, had more people could that have potentially put you in a different position in 09? And, I, and I'm asking that rhetorically. I don't think you can necessarily answer that. But, it, you, I, know, I, you know, I actually, I can't answer that one because 09 was, it was a different, it was a different market adjustment than the normal ups and downs and the little bubble bursts we had. Especially in my area, which was west of Austin, it just stopped. I mean, it absolutely, I've never seen anything like it stopped. Yes, of course, if I had a little maintenance company or something on the side could it have uh, could it have survived yes but it still would have had to have downscale and did what i did anyway which is you know mm -hmm. make the company smaller so it can continue along um that that was just that was at least for me and a lot of other people that i've talked to that one was just an absolute train wreck it just stopped overnight i've never seen anything like it John, There's only so much you can do for that. You know? We've heard that from a few people. But John, do you like? Was it similar here, like to the point where it just stopped, or was it more of the traditional correction where, where I I don't even want to call it a traditional it, correction. It was a slow trickle, I thought. You know, meaning there was the company I was with at the time. I just shut down my company in '08, um, and my first company, and I went and worked for somebody else. And what I saw was they were hiring at that time. And then boom, we end up getting stuck into a, a, a fact where the owner wanted to keep their normal rates. You get me? Meaning it was like, I, I'm not gonna give up anything. So when they should have just reduced their percentage a little bit to keep the work coming in, the, the guy I was with um, wouldn't change it up. Yeah, I think a so, lot of people, there was just nothing at least in, in my area as well, there's really nothing to be had. So a, a lot of, I know a few people offhand where it was, everything was good and everyone was growing and they started, you know, getting bigger crews and then buying all sorts of stuff for their crews and kind of spending frivolously because there was no end in sight. And then there was an immediate and abrupt end in sight. So these people who were building houses, doing additions, full scale remodels, were now, if they could, putting in windows, doing bathrooms, um, tiny stuff like that. Which, like, if you're if the scope and scale of your company is one thing, and then you're trying to, you know, you have how many guys or girls on board, and now you're going from doing full scale remodels to a bathroom or to replacing windows or a deck. It's a um, a big difference there. And you know, I was. How does Tyler stay on? Point when I see Jeff jump on the screen. Well, I was I just going to say I was wondering what how, how the Rhode Island market was, was what happened impacted in 08, 09 and all of a sudden this guy Jeff just barges in our Zoom meeting. Oh, barge it in, baby! I didn't see anything. I think I had my eyes closed. Sometimes <laughs> when I sometimes when I talk, I have to close my eyes so I'm not distracted. <laughs> was he wearing like a robe or anything? No, oh. smoking jacket. Jeff, come back. So. Wait, this is uh, Jeff Sweener. What's Jeff, up, guys? How's it going? Good to see uh, you. Hey, nice view out the back there, Jeff. Yeah, that's my that's my evening right there. Oh, jeez, that's not bad. Rub it in, dude. <laughs> it's not. It's not bad. Check out my green screen. <laughs> 
Jeff, we're talking about uh, 09, 08, 09, and, you know, where Wade was, he was working on, you know, a massive project, and we're talking about how if his company was at a different scale, maybe more people, he could have had more, you know, spider legs into, you know, different aspects markets, to, yeah, markets yeah. To, to sustain the company. But, you know, to, to Wade's comment, he basically said, it wasn't what he was west of Austin and, and work literally just stopped. And, yeah. you know, I asked John what it was like here. You know, I wasn't I wasn't immersed in it yet. And, you know, it was a, it was more of a slow trickle. So I guess the question, you know, down down in wonderful seaside Rhode Island, what was it like then? It, it dried up faster than anything. It was it was awful. It was awful. You had to reinvent yourself. What, it, so what did you, we, what did you I guys had do? just opened up a subdivision of, uh, That's right. 16 homes and, uh, it was crickets. Looks Absolutely. like you're wearing a lampshade for a hat. It <laughs> 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 that is well placed. <laughs> it's better. I think so we you, talked, I think we talked about that on your episode. Well, it's just like, you know, it, you basically, you had you had to like you 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 had homes that you were trying to sell right yeah so i started i opened that market with a uh, a single level kind of a retirement community uh about 2000 square foot homes that we started out with an asking price of 450 and at the end at probably 2011 we came back online with our first sale at 350 wow 2011 that's crazy it took it took a few years i mean in in the areas that i was in to come back it didn't immediately pop back in but you were but, gone at that point oh, i was gone i was gone at that but uh you know the this one this the project i did in the interim and then again the, the consulting uh, jeff's gone Lamp, <laughs> lamp that definitely that hit him it. in the head yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's still he's, connected he just had to but, uh, pick up the you know <laughs> The, hopefully that's that's something that's a rarity i mean sure. that's not the normal adjustments that we see you know the this thing that, that flows along all the time to where there, there's only so much you can do i mean mm -hmm. there's only so much you can do if something tanks that much i think as, if we go back nick into your thing of growth and sustainability and growth you know those sort of events have made me and a lot of people I talk to a lot more conservative, uh, you know, in, in the way that they approach things. Uh, but not saying don't grow. It's it's just making sure that you can adjust and, you know, whether a couple of months of, uh, you know, like we've had this year, it, it, this is a little bit more of a sustainable sort of market adjustment. Sure. And, and that's, that's what I was meaning. I got you. Well, I know Jeff only barged in here to uh, to chat about something real quick. So, what's up, Jeff? What are you up to? So we uh, we're working on uh, uh, this old house project that we did our first shoot in uh, late February. Kind of the initial the initial shoot where we take a tour through the existing house, exist, existing conditions. We meet the homeowners and then uh, we got that one in the books. We had scheduled for like two weeks later to do demolition and then COVID hit and uh, the whole thing shut down. So we were basically down from, you know, early March until late June where they were finally, you know, so remember this whole house is coming from Massachusetts. So there were all these rules, you know, state rules that Rhode Island had, that Massachusetts didn't have, and vice versa. So fortunately, we were able to kind of capture some of the B-roll, as you call it, of what happened during that project. It was such an amazing project. It was a shame to lose it. But, you know, we got some of it back. And then, uh, you know, so we're in the midst of that. We're supposed to schedule and finish that by probably December. And then we're into uh, another project that just sort of popped up, and that's a church that was built in 1881 
that uh, has an 80 foot steeple and bell tower. And we're going to repurpose that into a two, uh, two luxury condominiums. So <laughs> that's what's going on with me. That's badass. <laughs> that's crazy. So you guys, and uh, I know you get the podcast as well. Are you, are you involved with that at all? Um, you know, I, I, I did a little bit of it. I did a, I did a uh, segment with Kevin okay. and we talked about uh, balloon framing and fires. And, uh, you know, in my earlier years, I used to be a firefighter in, uh, in my town. And, uh, you know, we, I, we talked a lot about balloon framing and a lot about fires. And coincidentally, the house that we're working on right now, the, this old house project, you, we stripped down the, the ceiling and there was like the whole attic space was charred. So they had a fire at some point in history and um, the fire got up into the attic space and basically almost burned the whole place down. And they, you know, it went through the roof in one section. You could see where the, uh, the roof boards the, the you know, there was one by eight at one point and then it switched to like tongue and groove. So they repaired that. And uh, so I was on that podcast and then, I'm sure I'll be special guests for Chrissy is uh, starting this this podcast for Ask This Old House, and I'm sure he'll have me on a few times. This Old House Universe, right? Is that what it was, Nick? It's, yeah, I it's think like so. a it's like a cyclone. It just, it's just a, <laughs> you guys em, can't em, take em, you can't take all of the adjectives. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, for those that don't know, This Old House just launched a brand new podcast, uh, Ask This Old House podcast. It's their, their short segments uh, where Chris Hermites is uh, interviewing homeowners, getting their questions, and then bringing it back to the pros such as Jeff Sweener and getting those questions answered. Uh, so I know that launch, I think two weeks ago at this point. So if you guys haven't I think it was last it out, week, I think it was last Thursday was the first one that went out. Wait, John, we got to look forward because this podcast Sorry, comes yeah, out man. next week. This is episode <laughs> 138, dude. <laughs> Either way, guys, make sure you guys check out the, uh, the, the latest, um, uh, podcast from the, this old house universe cyclone as Jeff put it. <laughs> Jeff, thanks for the cameo, man. Yeah, no problem. I gotta jump on another podcast. Do you so, really? I yeah. I got I got like oh, four or five bit... I gotta do tonight. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> take care, All right, man. Good to see you guys. Th see you, take Jeff. care. See you on the next one. You got it. So Wade, John likes to have these surprise people just pop into our our Zoom. It's this new thing. He's been yeah, no, that uh, it seems like a good guy. Seems like a good guy. No, Jeff, a great Jeff guy. likes to go to bed early, so I didn't want so, to. Yeah, to uh, usually, yeah, we kind of wait to the end, quickly. but no problem. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm like, the, hold on, someone's trying I mean, to get is, in the meeting. Is it, we're getting back to you know market adjustments and growth because that kind of yeah. seems to be the the direction this this conversation's going, and it's it's a good one for sure. It's always the you know. Do I grow? Do I not grow? Is it worth it? Am I just going to work harder or am I going to make more money or, you know, is my business going to be better or is it good as it is? And that's, that's something that, you know, can only be answered by the individual. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the sustainability. And that's what I always warn people against is, is it going to be sustainable if you don't get that project? Because, even if it's signed on the dotted line, if the person, the financing goes away because the banks change their MO, because that was one of the big ones after that, you know, the crashes in 09 is before 09, you'd show up and say, Hey, I make, you know, X amount a year and I qualify for this loan to the bank and say, fantastic. Here you go. Go ahead and sign on the dotted line right. to now they basically, you know, they, they trace you back to your birth and, you know, can you pay for this? And we're going to re audit you every year to make sure your credit line is still okay. And it's just such a different set of rules. Mm. And I guess that keeps us in check a little bit. Uh, but even this year, you know, I, uh, Jeff, who was just on mentioned he had a project and it, you know, and it pulled out. I mean, it was the same way with us. We started the year thinking we were done. We were not going to, uh, you know, look for any more work. We had a, uh, 
uh, a big coffee company wanted us to build their corporate headquarters and it was going to be lots of fun you know a, a really fun project the whole covid thing hit first two weeks everybody was fine you know everything's going along there's no changes in our world to the angel investors decided they wanted to pull out uh, and that was our year now wow. we, we've adjusted and we've come back strong and we have you know a nice big beautiful house we're building up in the mountains on acreage with a gorgeous view i mean just you know the perfect sort of job you look for and we've gotten ourselves there but you have to be able to adjust i, I always have to be able to adjust and you know that's so that's the growth it's it's only too fast if it's too fast it's only too much if it's too much but right. if you can always hold pull hold back what, what does that mean that sounded elegant I just don't, I don't get it. Like, what it means like is that, today, today, everything's a highway for right. everyone's business because the economy yep. is so crazy. There's so much work. Any Joe Schmo, which we talked about last week, can jump on that highway, cut over three lanes and be in the fast lane. And there's no one, there's no cops, there's no, and there's no speed limits and it just go. You blow a tire, jump back on the speed. <laughs> like what, the, what's, what's slowing, what's, what's correcting people with the market it is right now? Well, it's not today. That's the point is that it is. I, I agree. The analogy of the highway is fantastic. I mean, there's, there's work everywhere. If you can't get work right this second, it's your own dang fault, right? I mean, there's, there's work everywhere, but what if it changes and you have too many employees, you have too much overhead or, a project that you were banking on to pay for next month's bills doesn't come to fruition. And I'm using this as a generality, right? To everybody out there. It's, I've learned that it's always good to say, okay, what if that doesn't work? What do I do? And with my, you know, think about it, too fast is only if, if it's too fast is always have to be able to adjust and pull back and shift over to the left and take another project if it comes on or keep keep the employees that you want to keep on board and and keep your business going so it is always there the, the highway's there but through experience and been doing this a long time it can go away like that and so having a stable company is is a much better approach does that answer your question john yeah i guess i'm trying to figure out what what a good definition for people listening and, and geez for myself what would create stability where i have stuff on the books we have processes like it's funny looking back at that project you had in 08 or 09 and you said you had a downsize you had one project and you i, I couldn't imagine having to worry about downsizing at that. What was the structure like for that? Were you the day-to-day -day guy on site? Or did you have a PM for that? I'm just trying no, to- I was, I'm day-to-day day -to -day guy, day -to -day guy. You know, I've, with my own building, I've always been boutique, meaning that the thing that I like about the building industry is I like to be involved. I like to, you know, I, I like to be involved with the client. I like to be involved in the day-to-day -day details. Having a, a big company within custom construction is just not something that I've ever pursued. Now, the company that I mentioned um, that we had that had 50 plus dealers all over the place, it was basically a franchise. That's a, that's a different sort of approach. There's not a lot of customization. It's like, look, you want some cabinets here, you want a floor, you want overhead storage what do you want in your garage um, that's a that's a much different approach so for me personally john the custom construction has always been that it's been boutique and custom so so on that project was it the fact that could you put an end date to that 10 million dollar build is that what if you were looking back is that what what basically caught you off guard the market changing i get that but you know not having enough tentacles i think that's what nick was getting at with maybe other employees in a different this reminds me a lot of the classic group in massachusetts where they were one of the leading re restoration remodeling companies that's who i looked up to they were in mm. the inside cover of every magazine what they executed was absolute perfection no matter what it was from a historic 
you know, replication or restoration or new construction or whatever. And they took on the New Balance build, which was in Newton. And it was like the talk of the entire state where everything changed. They put all their resources, everything into that build where they lost their regular clientele. Like they couldn't answer the phone for mm -hmm. three years because they had everything on that job. And, and that's, that's what spooks me a little bit. And, and to give myself stability, it's like, all right, maybe it, like Brad from AFT, happy 40th today. It's, it's like he dabbles in a little bit of real estate, actually a little bit of commercial real estate. Love to have him on the podcast because it's changed. And then he does a little bit of, of commercial stuff, like brewery, stuff like that. Then he does amazing custom. So being able to be diversified enough that you can take people from a certain division and put them into a, a division that is prosperous at that time of the economy is that s stability. You know I mean, I guess I want to understand yeah, if there's a silver can, bullet can to be, that. For sure. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I mean, for, for my eyes, again, it's major market adjustments and over leveraging. Okay, like, well, that's, that's the thing that's going to get you. Um, stability within a company. Okay, they, uh, rather than using credit lines, use cash in the bank. Uh, that was the big one before 09. And myself and a lot of other people, banks were lending all over the place. I mean, they, people were buying houses that they, for no way they should have been in the house for the amount of money that they were in, right? The banks were just lending all over. Goldman Sachs and a lot of those guys were just lending to anybody who wanted to. And, you know, I always, I always say, look, if credit lines are there as a necessity, but if you depend upon them too much, that's the easiest way to get in trouble. Uh, that that's the easiest way. So I always try to, you know, tell people, try to use your own cash reserves if you can. Uh, to sustain the company. And then those those adjustments, like you just pointed out, John, are a lot easier to do because you don't have this big looming debt over your head every day. I mean, no debt, no worries, as my grandfather used to say. And that's, that's easier said than done. Hmm. But as much as you can manage that, the better off you'll be. So that, that to me, fundamentally, the stability of a company comes from the lack of debt. And the people that I see that, that have success and can adjust is because they can make their own decisions and they can move left, move right, uh, do whatever they have to do to survive. I think um, as far as, so everything that's going on, I was having a conversation with someone today and as soon as things hit, it was like two weeks in and they're already going to their landlord asking for um, like reduced rent for their business. Um, and then the the landlord's coming back saying, no, no reduced rent. And then I guess enough people came to them that they worked out a deal where they could basically just bump their payments off three months, pay in full, no reduced rent, but not have to pay for three months, four months. And I'm sitting there having this conversation. I'm thinking to myself, if your business is not healthy enough that two weeks into this, you're already looking for reduced rent, you know, there's probably bigger problems. How successful, how um, sustainable is your business if, you know, when, when all of this hit, nobody knew when it was going to end, but everyone's looking to get bailed out immediately. Mm -hmm. Like everyone mm -hmm. wants somebody to come bail them out. And I just feel like if companies were healthier, um, if companies were structured more, I, I guess, like correctly, or if companies were living within their own means, they should be able to take these hiccups without looking for some sort of a handout. Um, I just feel like if you're in business, that's the way that it should be. And yeah, this was uh, an unexpected, unforeseen, but it was definitely, it's everyone can come out of this. The economy's crazier now than it has been. People are home, people are fixing up their houses. But, you know, three months ago, everyone had their hands out looking for something for free because they were going to go out of business. And, like, I don't know if the scare, like, if it scared anyone enough to make a change or it was just like, let's slow down a little bit and then we're going to go head first and make the same mistakes again. And we're going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to hire people 
and there's still leads coming in and nobody's really learning from this. Um, and it, it was just, it was a quick conversation today, but my takeaway on this is like, everyone's right back in the position that they were pre COVID scare and nobody's changed anything about it. You know, I, I would, I would second that Tyler. And I think you made there's two points I want to hit on is like one, you know, the comment you made about like, if you're not, if you're not in a position to be able to sustain two weeks without asking for a bailout, you know, the, cause I've had this conversation with a couple people and there's a big part of me, there's a part of me that agrees with that. But the other part of me is like, well, there, there's so much, there's so much depth to that where it's like, well, what was the position? Like, what were they going into COVID with? Were they trying to restructure their business? Were they in the process of fixing things? Did they take out a massive loan to get things corrected? Well, you know, all, there, there are so many layers to that, right? Where it's like, but you, you kind of double back on it in, in a sense and, and, you know, started talking about, well, now that we're through it and we're seeing the, the fruits of what COVID's done to our industry, you know, has anyone learned from it or are they just going right back to their old ways? And I think the you're you're probably right in saying that most didn't learn. Most are m- most are like, oh, never mind, let's let's keep rolling. But I think it's so incredibly important to even though many of us didn't suffer from it, you know, even though we had two four weeks of of scare, you know, I think taking having that that blip in our in in our industry hopefully checked everyone and everyone's like all right i don't want this to happen again yeah it's like the sting wasn't quite long enough you know you talk to people who went through 08 and were in the midst of that and everyone remembers that and that sting hasn't quite gone away and i feel like in our case it's everyone who you see and spoke to on social media and we're going to close down the doors and you know we have to lay people off and they're the same people right now who are like hey we're hiring we're buying new trucks we just got van number eight and it's like i don't know what the instability of everything right now it's very good but it's it's it could go the other direction tomorrow exactly Um, exactly and i think that I don't think that people realize that. I think that they're just looking, hey, it's good right now. It's busy. Let's take, take, take. Let's capitalize. And they're not necessarily planning for, like, excuse my language, but the shit show that could come right around the corner. Right. Um, Tyler, I also think those people have no problem just laying everyone off tomorrow and giving the trucks back to the the dealership and going, I'm good. They're not going to leverage themselves to keep employees to keep that family you know familyhood that's that they've created it's not everyone had I, I totally hear you tyler I, i've seen it it was a hiccup it wasn't even a blip yeah. for some so many people it was think, like oh the hiccup's gone i held my breath we're good and keep going so it's like what was it nick what did uh kevin say you know no one knows if you're sunbathing if you're uh skinny dipping if the tide never comes in and never <laughs> goes out and it's like that's the whole industry right now Right. And, and, I think and what, gentlemen, to, to bring it back again, that in 09, what you just said there, John, was, was right on it. When things went south, I saw people all over the place that just said, ah, oh, screw it, declaring bankruptcy. I'm done. Yeah, I'm right. not paying anybody. I'm, you know, and they left families and they left, you know, suppliers and things just out in the wind. They said, ah, eh, I'm done. This you know that's not what i did that's not what a lot of people did i mean there's the you know there's there's a little pride involved in it right i took the hit personally and and kept going and i'm not i'm not touting myself i'm just stating that that's that's what happened and i also agree with what all of you guys said right now i caution and and i'm a total optimist i i think people who do business the right way are always going to have work if you're willing and you have the ability to adjust, to move sideways, to down, downscale it, to bring it up a little bit, whatever you have to do to survive. I'm not totally convinced that there aren't going to be some more ups and downs within this cycle. And 
you know, like you guys, I mean, I talked to, you guys are up in the Northeast, right? I'm in the middle of the country. I know a lot of people on the West Coast. There's certain areas that are just blowing up. And there's other places where people are moving so fast that, you know, <laughs> they're, they're trying to get out of there. And all they want to do is get out. Mm. And so I think there's going to be micro environments and everybody needs to look at their own personal, you know, sphere of influence or where they're doing business. What is going to happen? I mean, uh, we're seeing a lot of people cause we're, we're right close to Denver and we're seeing a lot of people that are saying, okay, this, this inner city life was super fun. It was super fun. We're not, building in the city. We want to be out in the suburbs. We want to be out in the country. We want to move away from the city. So builders that build only in the city, what does that do for them? If they can't adjust and move themselves out into the country a little bit more, uh, you know, there, there's not going to be the building that's down there. Now it could adjust and it could all change tomorrow and the cities could be a, become a hot topic again. So the stability within a company, is you know that 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 is all important and it's interesting this is you know this, this topic we're talking about today because it's, it's so relevant the the crash in 09 is relevant to right now even if business is happening yeah i feel like ev- as strong as everything is right now the state of the economy can be extremely fickle and with everything that's going on politically you know it's an election year with um the societal issues that and pressures that we're all dealing with with covid that there haven't really been many times that have been this uncertain even though everything's hot right now and uh it's it's scary to think that that burn was not big enough to really make people say hey like that was overnight and it it picked back up pretty quickly but this could happen again um, something even worse can happen again. And I don't, I don't think that a lot of people are really taking that into account. I also think we're being ignorant about talking about it with the markets we have. Yeah. Meaning like, you know, if you're in, we're in cities and towns that have, you know, massive companies that are doing well and are able to weather their storm. But if you're smaller right. shops, like restaurants in the Northeast come this winter, I, I have no like I see tents up everywhere right now and it's like who knows what's gonna happen to that entire, you know, sliver of the population. And then I talk to some of my buddies that do commercial. Not like like think about like just those, you know, Avalons that go up. Like there's huge, you know, I wanna say light commercial, Nick. You know, not doing skyscrapers, not like the suffix, but there's companies that do like the fifty million a year that mm-hmm. are like like my buddy um Joey, he's like, Yeah, I had I go, How's everything going with you? everyone's been checking in on me and he's like yeah i had my name on three projects and then we lost all they all just got pulled and he's like so and he goes then i talked to his old boss and his boss is like i could be pushing a broom in a month so like i think i look at for me i you know going back to 08 09 when you used to drive through the city you see all these cranes going up and all the colleges in boston would go were going bonkers and then they were the first ones to pull the plug on all their projects was all the colleges because all the people that that basically advise those schools on all their money that they have, they were the ones that said like I think it was MIT Nick that opened it, the old Volkswagen dealership. They went seven stories below ground and they were building it back up. They capped it and they put a beautiful fence up and they were just like, <laughs> you know what? We're supposed to go another twenty seven stories. Not happening. So for me, every time I drive through the city, like one of my other buddies said that like when you see a building going up that doesn't reach another market of construction for another 18 months. Right. Like the guys that, that build those buildings, they're usually not the same crews that go inside and finish them. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, obviously niches of it, but like, I don't know. I think both of you guys are absolutely right that there's, I think there's going to be massive layoffs coming and it, depending on where you're at in the, in the country, it could affect you in a different way. Your market could dry up and going back to that story I was saying with, before Jeff jumped in was, the company I was with, they, they let pride get in the way. 100% is that they could have been strategic about letting people go and taking a small percentage. I remember there was a, we were, they had a sales guy and 
Bud, Buddy Day was his name. And he came up to me and goes, I don't know what's going to happen with this company. And I'm like, what? We were on staging because we were like, we did an attic renovation. So we had the staging set up. So you go in through the side. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we have a $900,000 renovation. And the client asked, instead of saying, hey, take this percentage off, said, can you make the powder room that we want to renovate disappear in the price? And he's like, I said yes, ran it back up the line, and the owner said no. He's like, that's like 15K. You couldn't make 15K go away over 900,000, but yet you lost 900,000 to get us through this, this massive, devastating time. So, and then before you knew it, I think our entire division in Sudbury was down to two people instead of eight within like six months. And it's like, if you had been able to understand, I think one stability in a company is, is knowing your numbers. Hey, what's my, what's the fat that's on the bone that if I needed to pull a little bit off that to keep you know the, the, the lights on and keep everyone in, employed, is that the right move instead of letting people go? You know, knowing those numbers down to the penny is super helpful going into a time like this or any time. Yeah, I think that you have to know how well you can operate fully staffed um, and how efficient you can be, but also yeah, with a full with a full workload on your plate. But you also need to be aware of what that cost is if there's not a full workload on your plate. Um, you know, are you going to have to offload people? Are you going to have to lay people off? Um, and I think. F- I think the hardest thing with everyone growing and not actually being able to inventory the health of your company because everything's changing so quickly that you don't know what it would take if things dried up. You don't know what operating a company looks like because it's always been up, up, up. Um, And, and, you know, things are good and people keep reaching in their pockets and everything else and you don't want to think about the bad times. But I think the smartest thing to do would be to kind of keep your head wrapped around this little blip that we had and what you would have had to do to sustain yourself as a company if things dried up pretty quickly because who knows you know the second time if this happens again maybe it's a few months before things turn around rather than like you know things picked pretty picked up pretty quickly again and it's a good it's the perfect time to look into this is now when times are good the the toughest time to figure out okay how do i fix my company how do i sustain how do i keep the people that i want to keep uh you know how do i keep things going is under stress and duress when it's going bad right Uh, now's the time to look at it and you know like we're we're all builders right we like to we like to build stuff that's kind of how we we started this conversation we didn't get into this because you know it was all money oriented. I mean, most of us probably said, Oh my gosh, I can make something really cool, you know, to begin with. And we don't necessarily like to look at the numbers. You know, I like to talk to the clients. I like to work with the subs. I like to go build stuff and and have a good time. But as a business owner, it's your responsibility to know what's going on and know what's happening from a financial standpoint know what's happening from an operational same standpoint and what's working and what's not working. Uh, you know, uh, now's the time to do it. Not when it's bad, but get control of it while it's good. It's like the thing, never go to a bank when you actually need the money, go to a bank when you don't need the money. And then if you, it's there for you later on. So the, the, I'm in agreement with what all of you have said and now's the time to see if your company is stable and that's done through data analytics uh, finances are the number one i mean a business owner is not looking at his finances every single day that's you've got to you got you got to look at it every day i think what you know what you just said in the beginning of that is you know yeah we don't want to be looking at it like it's not what i like do, doing i like talking to the client i like talking with my team you know the creative side of it but what you said is it's our responsibility as a business owner. And I think a lot of, uh, you know, I think a lot of people forget that where it's like, no, I'll just hire a bookkeeper and they'll just check in with me, you know, once. And I've been there. I've been at a point where it's like, I've tried to hire people where it's like, Hey, I just want to touch, touch point, you know, once a month, but it doesn't work. It's you're, you're, it's, you're, 
I never looked at it at, or, or considered like, hey, it's my responsibility. It's like it just became a necessity where it's like, all right, the only way I'm going to grow is to be able to understand how I can grow. And beyond the beyond the amount of people or the projects or the sales, it's like, what does the company require to survive today? And if I want, if this is what it requires to survive today, and I want to be here, well, what's that? What's that connection point? You know. And I think, I think you have to know it as good as you do your job sites. Like Tyler, you know how like weedy and all this stuff. When we talked about last week, it's like Red Guard over the scenes. Why would you do that? Like yeah. if you knew your finances of your project as well as you knew the intricate pieces of tile and, and the underlayment and how are they going to react and you know when do you do certain things and that's if you relate it to that so people listening is like we all love learning that new part of you know a, a different tile that has a manufacturer's spec that you want to make sure you have it right would you dig into your finances the same way you would for that fun part of tile well i think that you sh if if you are responsible for providing for people who are underneath of you and you're growing a company i think it is your duty to understand that and how you're going to be able to keep them busy and sustain that business even if business isn't your phone's not ringing you know that that's what you signed up for that's part of growing a business isn't just the positives it's not just the fun it's not just seeing the finished product and working with the people and i think that and that's one of the huge reasons why i have almost zero desire to scale my company is because I don't enjoy any of that. My, the way that my company is structured right now is so simple to know what comes in, what goes out, what costs me money, what doesn't, where I can, you know, change things around to make it work. So I get to focus on the things that I do enjoy. Um, and like, it doesn't keep me up at night. And that's not to say that that's the best, you know, I know it's not really a business in air quotes. Like it's me getting paid for my time and I have a helper and it, it's, it's very primitive the way that I'm doing things, but I do get to focus on things that I like and I do get to focus on things that I enjoy and I get to be there on site and I don't have to spend hours of my life going over my financial situation because it's, it's very black and white and it's very transparent and you know, it's very linear. I understand that. And I can have a bookkeeper and pay her a couple hundred bucks a month to go through everything and get on a phone call with me. And, um, it's easy, but I, I personally, I don't want the responsibility, um, of having to ensure that I can provide for people and for their families and everything else. And maybe that's selfish, or maybe I just know that like, I know my own capacity, uh, and what I can handle. You know, and, and Tyler, I want to touch on that and, and go into that a little bit depth. But the the first, I want to make one point on when things are going good. A company is most inefficient and has the most fat on it. It needs to be trimmed when things are going great. People aren't thinking about it. You know, there's money coming in, there's clients coming in, there's jobs going, everybody's happy, everything's going great that's when the company's the most inefficient because they aren't paying attention to the details. They aren't worried about, oh my gosh, you know, am, am, am I going to get in trouble with this? Is this going to get me into hot water? Am I going to be upside down in this area? So it, it's a tough thing to do, but it's when things are going good right now. I, I, I think this is a stress point of everybody needs to look at their company now. And that leads me right into exactly what you just said, Tyler. And I think you hit a, a really good point. Every single person who has their own construction business, whatever it may be, has a vision of what their ideal company is. And that to me is one of the most important things. And what I talk to a lot of people about is what do you want out of it? I mean, you have, you know, some people take the responsibility of their employees and, and we have to keep everybody going. And I just have to go, well, what is your business? Is it what you wanted it to be? Is it what you want it to be in the future? Is it, are you happy doing it? And with your point, Tyler, about, you know, you, you don't care. It, it, scaling it and making it humongous and having to look at the numbers and that, 
that that takes you away from what you want. And I think that's that is ultimately important because if things go bad and you're still able to have a company that's sustaining and you still kind of get to enjoy it because it's the way you set it up and get to be around the people you want. I think that's immensely important. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely pros and cons to it. And, you know, the, the, the biggest um, risk is the obvious, you know, I'm the person exchanging time for money. So there's there's that end of things. Um, but I do, I weigh that against other things and I weigh that against the mental health and I weigh that against my, my life away from work and how I would treat my family and how I would feel. And it gets to the point where it's like, Hey, I have to do what's good for me in my life, for my family, for everyone else and what I can handle from handle from a mental standpoint and what makes me the best person because then I can be successful on the job. I think I forget. Um, it was the, the stair guy who we had on who said if he knew, um, in business that the relationships were way more important than actually doing a good job, he would have been far more successful early on. I think that's true. If you're not in your right mindset and you can't deal with customers correctly and you can't deal with your subcontractors or, handle the personal interactions on the job. It doesn't matter if you nail every job, if it's 110%, um, I don't, you know, you're not going to get the return customers. You're not going to get the word of mouth referrals, which I think are for my business, the best leads, the way that we operate. Um, and you have to kind of consider and weigh the fact of what makes you the best person in your life and in your business and in your family. And I think you're giving yourself an opportunity to be successful at that point. And it can be the opposite as well. Um, you know, I have guys that I work with that have never held a hammer <laughs> and they crush it in the construction business, right? Because they are much more into the, the numbers and growing the company and they have large companies that are very stable and they're doing a great job. It just depends on whatever gets you personal joy out of your company. And what a, a philosophy I stick by is anybody that I hire into a company better be better at that job than I am. Or what am I hiring them for? That's, that's the whole point. Hire people that are better than you at a particular job and let them do it. And yeah, and, I think and, Nick says that a lot where, you know, he's bringing people in and he's realizing that his, his best place and strongest place in the company is not wearing a tool belt. And he understands that. Um, and I think that that is very important that you, you have to position yourself to be able to be the biggest attribute to your company. Um, and then you need to bring people in to help you if that's your goal to get bigger, to kind of, you know, bring them in on their strong suits and hone that in and kind of build your team from there. But, um, again, that's just, that's not, that's not a good fit for me. So I don't try and, um, force that because anything I force in my life, if it doesn't work out, it's just, all right, never should have forced that. Um, so I've just kind of given up on that at this point and I'm okay with that. The, the only thing I want to add to that is that it, you had said Wade that like being financially driven, you know, most of us are craftsmen and we want to focus on that part of the business. I think I got hung up for a moment in time in my career is that I didn't want to be, let's say financially driven in air quotes. So I, I focused more on the carpentry and the craftsmanship part of it in the relationship. But the reality is me being dialed into my numbers doesn't mean I'm financially driven. You know, oh, that's, that's not driving my company. It's, it's a necessity that I need to know it in the everyday day to day. But that's just part of running it. Whether even if it's if you're a small guy, let's say your dad, Nick, doing fences, he's got to keep inventory. He's got to know all these things that has to happen. So it could be the plumber. It could be the handyman that just does hardware. You need to know what it is. So in case you're, let's say the, the brakes go in your truck, that could be a massive impact to somebody. I, I've seen guys that I work with now in the trades that, that are phenomenal artists but they have not put the time into their business. So they're basically borrowing a vehicle to come bring a piece of you know product to us that they've created to install it. 
I, it happened the other day. I was on a job and I was like, oh, you, you know, I was so excited that there was a new truck on the job site. And I'm like, dude, you made like you made the right moves. You know, you're financially stable enough that you, you know, you put you went to the bank, got the truck, blah, blah. And I said exactly that to him. And he's like, yeah. And then we're sitting there together trying to load this thing up. And he goes, yeah, I borrowed that truck. <laughs> like like when everything settled down after my excitement that of like the install happening and it was just him and me on a saturday and he's just like yeah i borrowed that and i'm like what do you mean he's like well you know my other truck had got an accident i i paid for it outright and at, at a point it turned into like lies to to make it feel better <laughs> that this is the situation we're in but i was like i'm gonna talk Goals. about it that's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna reach for new you truck know, yeah, but, but, no, but it was just like how do you run a business if you like I had been asking for that piece to be installed for a long time. And he wasn't, it was done. It, it was, had nothing to do with the product and any of that stuff. It was how he ran his finances. And that was holding him back from being a true artist and a craftsman at right. what he needed to do. And that could absolutely implode his business, no matter how good he is or she is at that one pass that's but amazing. how does this go absolutely back? and it's like would you hire a sub who their work was 110 percent, but their communication blew or they didn't show up or get done when they said they needed to like there's a feel, value to that subcontractor I and feel like we if, do. if they show up on time and maybe their work is uh you know a 90 instead of a 95 but they show up every day they're on budget they're on schedule like that person is more valuable asset to you and your company and your team than somebody who does amazing work but can't show up or can't communicate or always runs late or has you know my truck broke down i won't be there um it's more than just the work that you put out yeah and i think it, it you know i feel like oftentimes we we let that stuff slide where it's like you know what the work's great like i'll deal with the the excuses i'll just you know I'll just put more management on them or I'll just, I'll pad the schedule for them or I'll, I'll, I'll make other people work around them. And it's like every time, you know, I speak for myself. It's like every time I do it, it's like, I'm just making my job and my guy's job way more difficult. Yeah. And it's just, I, like, I it, think it, that, I think that customers, even if you think it from a customer standpoint, if you delivered a B plus, job rather than an a minus and that b plus you know you showed up every day you treated them with respect you were on time with your delivery i think that they would be far more receptive um, they would be more grateful they'd be happier it'd be a better experience for them than if you delivered them that a minus or that a and you were a dick and you didn't get done and then you charged them change orders because you didn't plan for it. it's it's so much about the experience and it's so much about your relationship with those people. Um, I think, you know, obviously quality of work. And if you're selling a higher caliber of work, you have to fulfill what you're selling. But at the same time, like those relationships, that's what's going to um, kind of propel your company long term. Just doing good work isn't it's not good enough. Wait, this goes into, a, a, you know, a comment we've made a handful of times is, you know, Maybe that guy John's talking about is never going to understand the finances, right? You know, hiring someone to run that side of the business. It's like, because your comment, you know, you uh, and I want to, I basically want to make the connection. Like you made a comment earlier about how the, the owner of the business has to be in tune, looking at the financials every day, just that it's their responsibility, which in, in a large way, I agree, but, you know, in the scenario that John's talking about hiring someone to run that business, you know, that's a, that's a viable option, but what really? is, you know, what does that, you know, where does that responsibility now lie? You know, it's, and, and I totally agree with your comment, Nick. It's, it, it comes back to find somebody who's better than you at a certain part of the business and put them in place, whether it's the finances or it's the work itself. Um, I'll use, you know, for my, my company, Domus Builders out here, I have a fantastic partner by the name of Mike Holm. And never in my life if I had a guy that, that compliments me more in my business that I, that, that I want to do and what he wants to do. And um, Mike is, is a builder's builder, builder. Right. He's just 
I mean, he's the code master. He knows everything. He can build it all, and he does it great. So he handles a lot more of what's in the field, in the daily operations. At this point in my career, I'm, I'm a lot more of the uh, you know interaction with the clients, the sales, the finances, the things of that. And, and part of it is uh, and there's a, there's another story for another beer, which it has a, a motorcycle accident that I don't. Uh, I, I can't lift things and work as much like I used to, right? So it, it, there's some necessity in there, but he and I complement each other perfectly. Uh, and, and you just have to find, but he and I do talk about the finances, but what he does is he asks me, <laughs> you know, what is, what's going on with the finances? Right. And I turned around and, and asked Nicole Landau, Nick, as you well know, what is, <laughs> what is going on with the finances of the company? And she tells me what's going on and what I can and cannot do that month, right? So you just, you have to find the people that you trust and you want to hold on to. And in our industry, I'll, I'll take things as a whole again. I mean, one of the reasons why I love the building industry is the people. It's, we, we have, so, the, the people care about what they do. They have a physical element that they get to show you what they've built or what they've made. And you, you just have to find the people you can trust. And sometimes as you have to go through a few to find that right person. And within the stability of the company, of which has been kind of our general topic here, those people that continually show and stick with you when it's tough, those are the ones you want to keep around while it is tough because when it gets good, they're going to help you out even more. And so I, th I think I answered your, your question, Nick, about, um, well, I you think know, it's just important to shed light on that is that, you know, because we've talked about that and we've promoted that where it's like if you're not good at it, maybe it, you hire someone to focus on the business side of it. You know, even in Tyler's case, it's like, you know, Tyler, you know, want would prefer to be in the field than run, you know, than necessarily deal with the finances day in and day out. But he still remains in tune. And I think that's, you know, a case where like the scenario John's kind of painting is that, you know, that person could could do the same find someone that can help really maximize the 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 company as you know a financial structure and then just have touch points yeah yeah so i love all this this is great talk and i sound super negative and i hate this you um sound negative <laughs> just lead it in that way <laughs> um is that so like when i had my first company i remember like when someone didn't pay me for 1200 dollars for a tile floor it was in walpole i had done the addition it was a change order oh this I is just a hypothetical right no no this is legit. <laughs> i can give you the address um, but like i remember every single non-payment i ever had to date and i remember sitting there going well i could get an attorney i could do all that but you know how i, I need to move on to the next project to make money and i and i feel like you know yes that's 16 years later 17 years later i've worked past that and and put the value on getting an attorney that's a partner having an accountant to review my books on top of my bookkeeper all these things but to, to hire someone better than me and not knowing my finances okay let's let's paint that picture mm -hmm. how do i hire somebody when i don't know what's going on like meaning i don't even know how to fix my own truck that I'm reaching out to ask somebody in the same building for a truck so I can do an install in order to get paid. How does someone in that mindset wrap their head around being able to then invest in someone who can then run their company financially? Are you saying as far as finding someone? No, just understanding how they can afford to do that when they oh, can't okay. get out of their own way. Can't, when they can't afford to, right. When they when, can't afford when, to. They probably can it's just they haven't looked even closely enough at the books to know how this month is going and they may have like there's so many people that don't invoice on time because they're you know they're fine that month you know how many right. people i ask for an invoice be like hey can you get my bill cycle is not the same as what yeah, you can need you give me an invoice in no nah, i'm good this month yeah it's, it's like, like no, 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 no i need the bill <laughs> yeah. for me in this right. project so give me the invoice but those are the same people that have these yo-yo you know effects during the year that they're not just steady so i guess if to the kid that was 22 years old if you if we could talk to that john how do i understand to get around wrap my head around the finances and go i'm having a hard enough time paying myself to then bring somebody on board 
and have that conversation with finance. So because you're so scared to know what the books really are. Yeah, you, you know wait. Am I wrong? End, you, you, no, you, <laughs> I just right, feel like you have to right, you right, have right. to start you have to start somewhere and you have to position yourself to be able to get to that point where you can hire someone. You know, when you first start out, you got to wear that hat. But and if you about, don't know anything about how that hat fits, like you got to get books or you got to talk to people, you got to go right. take a, a course at the community college and you have to get yourself off the ground and then you can start allocating those responsibilities. I feel like it's the same thing as the site work where you can't hire somebody to do your tile work until you understand how to do your tile work yourself. But um, I can understand that. It's like, it's like going to the doctors and knowing that your shoulder or your kidney hurts, but you're like, I still won't go do it. Like, I don't even know what my kidney is or yeah, does. But, but so. I'm just saying like, it, you know, people don't want to go to the doctors because they don't want to know what's wrong with them. I feel like finances in a company, when you're super small, it sh it, to you, it's like, oh, this should be easy. But it's not. So, yeah, the right move is to find that person, to dial it in. But I guess it's like, I wish I had told myself how to have that conversation back then. Be like, hey, find that person. It's going to be way worse over the next two months. But it's better than being bad for the next two years. Hmm. Where you go, like, I, th I forget who said it on one of the podcasts. Oh, it was the um, the Fighter podcast. Where he's like, I went on, on a holiday with my girlfriend and didn't know which credit card to use because I didn't know which one was maxed out. Like, there's a, a thousand people out there that have this more than that, whatever. Oh, a huge, all the time. Right? It's, all so the it's, time, yeah. I, I want to talk to those people. So be like, hey, just look into this. It's so worth it. But isn't, isn't that the same like barrier to entry conversation that we were having before where if you're not in a position to be running a business where you have your, you know, your credit cards are maxed out and you can't afford to put somebody in place to look at your books, maybe you shouldn't be in business. Like maybe that is weeding out the people who aren't, who shouldn't be, shouldn't have their own company, who shouldn't be working for themselves. And that's that's not to sound harsh or ignorant, but I think that you, ha in our industry, if there were a higher barrier to entry and you had to, you know, bond certain jobs or you had to be able to cover your mistakes or, you know, you didn't depend on people to give you a handout when the economy tanks that like you could afford to hire someone, you could afford to take time off to take a class. Um, I think that, it's it's super easy to have a construction company right now and it's super easy to not have experience whether it's on the job experience or business experience and i think that some of those people probably do need to learn the hard way and then i think the younger guys and girls who just if they're afraid to do it john you got to tell them to do it and then like that's all you can do at that point it's up to them to make that move and it's the it's the same as anything else like you can tell them how to set tile but it's up to them to try and figure that out on their own and they have to figure out what what path is going to make the most amount of sense for them it's, it's funny the, the tile analogy it's it's we'll devote more time to understanding how tile will fail and, and the bigger you know issue in the room is definitely finances but for sure to to, to you know, how are you going to afford when the tile fails? You know, how are you going to replace the tile when it fails? But like, it's more, I don't even feel like the tile failure is that as much as like pride, you know, yeah. that you get to go rip something out that you did, or what's the customer going to say where it's like, no, how, like what's going to take a hit from this? Is your family going to take a hit or your employees going to take a hit? Um, how is this going to affect you? But I think it, I, I agree but to John, to John's point, like, I think John's trying to get to like, well, what would, you know, John didn't give up like 20 year old, 22 year old John didn't give up. Like he, you know, but if he could go back and tell him, you know, Hey, do this, like, how, like, yeah, you don't think you can afford this. Like what, what nugget could we give anyone that's listening? Right. That's in this position. Like how do they take that first step? And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about, when I when I did when I had to make that first step and it was you know every year John you you, you say it's like no one wants to know where the books are at but every, once a year at least 
if you're paying taxes, you you find out. Yeah. And it's and and it's usually a huge surprise, like it, when when you don't have your your shit together, right? And I think about what like early on and we talk about how this should be taught in college and all that but early on it's like all right i remember sitting down and jeff is my 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 cpa and i'm like jeff i need i need help i need to understand like what is my like who who do i need on my team and that's because he was the only one that was doing it by and it was required because i was pay i had to pay taxes and he was the one that said this is what you need you you need someone to do this and I remember I hired, I said, can you do it? And he said, yeah. And I'm, but I'll be double the money. I'm like, until I figure out who that might be. Uh, and can, I asked, can I afford to pay you to do it? And, and he helped. And that was, you know, I guess that would be my advice is you talk to your, to talk, talk to the guy doing the taxes and find out like, you know, Hey, do you know someone that could come in and keep my books up to date? And get invoices. They they have a network of people, and at the very least, they can be a temporary crutch in the meantime. And you so, know, yeah. And and sorry, and Wade, you know, just to piggyback on your 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 shout out, like that's how I end up finding Nicole. Like I I knew I needed someone to help with the books, and it was, you know, I I started looking, and she randomly came across my LinkedIn. And reached out. And we chatted, and I and she. I had Jeff, my accountant, interview her. And they got on the phone. And they talked through, and they went through the process. And he, and he was like, "Yeah, seems pretty legit. I think that's a good move." It's funny because it's it's just not sexy to invest in your company in that way. And I think that the younger people starting out, they want to buy the tools, and they want to buy the new truck, and they want to have all of that stuff where like it appears that they have this this successful company when in fact the new truck doesn't make you any better on the job it doesn't make you a better business person um investing in your company investing in the book end of your business it's the same thing if you're riding motorcycles like people want to get a motorcycle and they want to put new grips on it and new tires and exhaust and all of this stuff <laughs> to make them a better rider. And it's like, spend money on your suspension and get your bike tuned to fit you. But like, people don't want to do that. They just want to put the stuff on that looks cool. That's not actually going to help them. Um, it's probably just, the same thing. Remember when you were little <coughs> and you used to get new sneakers and like throw on new sneakers, you're like, yo, I'm going to run. So you'd like just run and be like, yeah, they're mm -hmm. definitely faster. <laughs> yes. It's like, no, like you invest in it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, right. Like, but if you're playing hockey and you put the best gear on somebody, wow. they're not going to be any better of a hockey player. Like, no, invest those in guys your are diet. Out there. They're all right? showing no go. Invest like in your Nick diet, in invest in your yeah. training, <laughs> you know, hire a personal trainer, sure. but that's not sexy to spend money on that. It's way cooler to have a brand new set of skates and, you know, like a new stick to play with. And I think that the, that's part of the problem that it's not it's not a, a fun, exciting way to spend your in reinvest in your business. But you know, what's crazy is like, I, I look back and like my boys are, are nine and, and 13 and I'm like, I want to teach them about credit cards. Like the value, like Cam's like, I don't need a credit card. I'm like, you actually do. It helps you build credit. You don't, you gotta pay. Like no one had that conversation with me. You know, it's the same as food. I had never for like 30 years, Realize that, that Caesar salads weren't good for you. <laughs> no, no, that there was like a uh, what is it? Um, I'm trying to serving, serving oh, size yeah. on anything. Like I know this is nothing to do with construction, but it's like <laughs> when you understand that like it's a bag of chips that's it's have a serving of like 35. <laughs> you, when you murder that in one sitting, guess what? You're gonna have health issues. But I, I think it's it's. The finances are absolutely crazy not to look at them. And, and I love, I don't love it. It scares me is that you see all these companies that are young and they have all these trucks with like, I, you were talking about bikes, Tyler, but I was thinking about like everyone that has like the, the tricked out exhaust for their truck, it's their the work same truck thing. And, and, the, and the crazy rims and they drive around and I'm like, that's only because you're, you know, taking advantage of the economy and that will become, I've watched all those companies go out of business. 
and then go work for somebody else. Yeah, like you're not a better carpenter because you put rims on your truck. But you're not a better business. You're portraying this successfulness with this image of this truck that's lettered, that's all bedazzled, but it's just that. You know, all that falls off. All the glitter falls off. It's how you run that job and how you run your business. And that's what's going to give you the ability. Wait, when I when I talked to you before about, you know, when you're doing that, I'm like, maybe, maybe he's got it on me where I don't need to be. I'm trying to make that separation where I don't need to be the point guy on the job for like the biggest jobs we have. And maybe I can just let my guys roll with it. So that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. You know, and same thing. Like I had a call with, so we have a CPA that we have on, basically we pay him a couple hundred dollars a month just to look at everything. You know, our our accounts, we only have a couple accounts and, you know, Riverhead, our biggest one, because we probably do probably just under a million with them. We pay it off before the 10th of every month, so we get 5% back and it's like great, but it's like I said to him this year, like we had a call with Ben, myself, our um, bookkeeper, and then the accountant. And I was like, hey, you know, this is, we're going into finishing year three. I was like, I want everything out of my name and into the EIN of the company. That That's my overall goal going into 2021 is that right now I sign for everything. Mm. <laughs> like credit card, uh, all that stuff. So it's like, you know, we're, we're working on getting our credit line approved. It was going through COVID. And it's like, how do we do that? And it wasn't the same thing. I was like, I don't need it. We haven't needed it for two and a half years. And the bank was like, and my accountant's like, get it now. So you have it, and if you need to use it to cover an invoice, because we have, they've basically looked at our books and studied it where we will use our profit to cover that check. to keep Because we get, you know, I feel like it's a penalization of the project if I can't pay a sub to get stuff done, because then that influences my next draw or my next, you know, pro- progress on the project. So we'll cover that. But then my accountant's like, you can't do that. You need to put profit where it needs to be, and then if you need to draw from the credit line, do that and the other part of it that we didn't talk about was money's so cheap right now that don't use yours but you have to do it in a very methodical way like if we draw from that credit line we've talked about it as a team then we need to know where that where that check is due from you know it's just it's not just free money like a credit card when we're all in high college and you're like you know you get a free shirt if you apply for this credit card you know how many free shirts i had like just to get the shirt, <laughs> like, like no one told you that like this is a stupid move, and it's how do you understand those things and that that's the last to get taught I feel like because it's it, not it something is, you take a picture of. And it's the last thing guys really want to think about. I mean, this within within this last ten minutes, gentlemen, we've jumped down a very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this well, is a welcome. lot of discussion on this. But, you know, I, I, I'm going to start, John, where, where, where you start. What would I do? What, what would you tell my 21-year-old self? Like, you know, what, how, do, how do I do this? And I think, you know, it's, you got to run towards the uncomfortable. It's, mm-hmm. Finances make people uncomfortable because they don't want to know. Well, on the flip side, what if it's good news and you get it under control and you look at it every time, you're like, dang, I got it. I got it. It's, it's moving. Things are financially stable. The health of a company is the finances. If it's financially stable, you can go do marketing if you market. You can hire new people if you want to hire new people. But you have to know what's going on. I mean, as as general contractors, which is you know what what we do, we know eighty five percent of everything and one hundred percent of nothing. Right? I mean, that's what we turn to a tile guy for. We'll go back to tile guy. We hire the tile guy because he's going to be better at the tile. You have to know as a business owner, you, you have to at least know what's going on with it. So hire a bookkeeper. That's a great way. I mean, a lot of bookkeepers are more than bookkeepers. They'll tell you if something's going wrong, but it's also the reports, the data analytics that come out of a company. You need to know what your profit and loss is for that month, for that month. You need to know how, how much money do I have? AR receivables, right? I need, what's my receivable report? How much money's coming in at the end of the day? Okay, well then what's my payable? Who do I owe money to? You know, I've got, I've got the painter, I've got the tile guy, I've got to, you have to know what these things are so you can be, you know, financially stable. Once it gets set up and you get the systems in place and here's one of the things that really worries people. 
with, with hiring people to look after their finances. We've all heard the horror stories. The bookkeeper takes advantage of somebody. They're buying themselves gas off to the side every day, you know, and nobody knows what's going on with the finances. That's why a business owner always needs to look after the finances. Now, eventually you'll find people that you trust wholeheartedly. Uh, once again, as Nick and I have, you know, you, they're, they're looking after your action and they're doing it, but there's a lot more discussion on this subject and it's different for every company, but really run towards the uncomfortable, get to know it, know what's going on. So you can look at the report once a week and see what's happening. And, and then you can go out and concentrate. And you guys know the, the truck doesn't get you more business. It really doesn't. It's, it's the look in your eyes. It's the way you handle your business. It's, the word of mouth from the business before, you know, did you finish on time? Pretty close. Did you finish on budget? Pretty close. Yep. All right. Well, good. That's what we want to do. The, uh, the, the, but the young guys get excited. Young people get excited. They want that stuff and Hey, they should, if they're working hard, they should reward themselves. But, um, it, it's, it's absolutely a priority. And on Tyler's comment, it is the truth. Not everybody's made to be a business owner. It's, some guys are, are better off and they learn the hard way that they're much better off working for somebody who's going to look at the books and make sure that he gets a paycheck every month and then they can concentrate on making that tile dead nuts perfect, right? And that's what they want to focus on. So it's um, it, it, you have to look at it. Two things. I want to be so profitable that I can tell a story that someone's trying to steal from me. Whether it's gas, <laughs> just straight, just straight up. Like I want to be. I'm pretty sure my wife does. <laughs> I didn't get gas from here. Well, I didn't order anything from Target from the business. Tyler, it's or Tyler and John. It's funny. Uh, last week, one of my new guys, the um, I always go through the credit card statements, and I got this like cr- like it was like twenty three hundred dollar charge at mercedes and i was like what the so i call him he's like yeah i went in for the sticker and the service and etc i'm like oh yeah we needed tires that that makes complete sense i forgot we, we already talked about it, it made, made sense the neck it was like the next day or like the next uh, a couple days later 500 hundred dollar charge at a truck center i'm like okay what the like what mm-hmm. the hell is going on and i show up job i'm like tim what what's up with the five hundred dollar charge? And he's like, what? What, what? what are you talking about? And he's I'm like at the truck center, and I pull up the I pull up the app. It shows Tim's guard. I'm calling him out. I was I wasn't gonna use his name. Hey, t- <laughs> hey, 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 hey Tim. Uh, and he, and I'm looking at it, and I'm and I'm like I'm to- I'm looking. I look it up on Google. It's a gas station. I'm like, what did he buy at the lottery gas station? tickets? And and he's like scratchies. He's like digging through i think he was digging through his pocket or he had on his phone he goes i swear to god i didn't like and he pulls it up he goes what was the date and i tell him the date he goes i have it right here 53 dollars 14 cents i'm like what the like what the hell so i watch the charge for a couple of days and then it go because it sits impending and then it goes through 53 dollars 14 cents like why like what why would they charge me 500 yeah so I, I looked into it more it's a big truck stop so that you know how we, you prepay gas and it's like you, it's automatic 100 oh yeah the big truck stops automatic 500 <laughs> uh, they're thinking it's a semi <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm like i'm sitting there I'm like what is this kid buying for this van this van's all, must be all pimped out hmm. no just just straight up just now you automa- just gotta get an ns and ns um but that's a huge like that's a huge amount I, i'm in awe that every week your time management is flawless. <laughs> I do like, it on the fly. I just, it takes, but it's just re- like, I forget what last week I listened to last week's podcast. I haven't listened to one in a minute and I forget what you said. And I was like, so he does all this and then he goes home <laughs> and I forget what you looked up or whatever. And it was like, I'm like, how did you, I, I immediately look at myself and go, I, I, I don't know when I, when I could do that. When, what time would I be able to do that at? And I'm just like, and I use every minute of the day. Now it's tough because I'm still having a little bit of vertigo. So when I'm in my truck, I'm literally just like trying to stay focused on the road. (laughs) And it's like, 
but I, I just, think you're, I'm I amazed think you're, by like, oh, he caught that. Caught it while it was still pending. It probably p- was pending for 24 hours. And he caught it in the first. <laughs> oh yeah, and it just happened. It just like happened to be like perfect timing when I was going to see him the next day. So I had to like, I had to say, and I, and it wasn't like you know, to, to Tim's defense, I wasn't not trusting him. I just was like, why the hell is this $500 charge on the card? Um, you I don't know. know. I've, I've got a concern in that, Nick. I mean, you're buying tires from a dealership. That's my that's my concern. Well, you paid no, double. You well, gotta watch, you gotta watch those finances. Care. Well, number one, the the van was is under warranty, so it, it needed some other work, but it 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 needed a brand new turbo. Apparently, the turbo was disconnected from the 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 engine or something. Um, mm-hmm. I sound like an idiot, but either way, it was like seventy five hundred dollars worth of damage to the to the motor that was covered under warranty. So I am fine going to the dealership. Getting, right I'm getting the tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever. Well, that's, they need. Uh, you know, it, and it's touch. I don't know what our what our time frame is right now here, guys. But all night. Um, <laughs> We're going back to that beer store where you got an accident. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was uh, that was Moab, Utah, <laughs> with one of my clients. Funny enough, um, but uh, you know the. The, the, the finances lead into another section of the company, which is the, the procedures and protocols, we'll call it, right? Which are the systems of your company. And, and this actually leads exactly into the tires that Nick bought too much, spent too much money on at the, at the dealership, okay? It's, they're really nice. It, oh, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're beautiful White, Mercedes white water, tires. Right? I'm sure Pirelli. they're gorgeous. They're Pirelli. Um, but it's, as a business owner, you have to stay 10,000 feet, even though you get bogged down by the daily problems, mm. right? It, it, it's a tough, it's a tough to position to be in, especially if you have multiple employees and, and multiple jobs and different things going on. And to be able to, if, if you have control and you know what's going on, like, like Nick, you saw something just from looking at your bank account because you're so on top of your finances that, hey, what is that? That's a weird thing. Well, the other things that start popping up are, am I spending too much money for gas? Am I, where, why am I double paying for this? And then you can refine it. And then there's the profit. I mean, it's, I want by no means for you guys to think that I think that profit is a, is a bad part of the company. It's when I said, you know, going for money being the first thing in a company, but we're all here to make money. We want to, the more money we have, the more money there is to have a better business for people to work at. It's a healthier environment and you have happier people and everything just, you know, in theory rolls off of that. But if you know what's going on with the finances and you can get the reports of what's happening, you can see how to better run your company out in the world and use that data to make things more efficient which creates happier clients and happier uh, employees. Yeah, I think it's about the team. I think it, it gives you better growth models. That way you can compensate people the right way. Maybe it's not just financially. Maybe it's going back to school. Like we have a, a guy that's going to start with us that, hey, if you do night classes at Wentworth for Construction Management, we'll help pay for that You know, mm-hmm. as long as you get a certain grade. But knowing your finances, I guess I, I've gone, I've helped run multiple companies since I shut my company down way back in the day. And I was always amazed that once I got in the door and, and had like the director of operations role is that like, I'll be like, Hey, where'd the 18% come, whatever it was, 12% come from for over- markup and overhead. And they're like, we don't know. Like it was just a straight up guess and it worked for how many years. And it's like, well, do we know what that's covering? Like it's, I really, I always bring it back to like that toothache, like that toothache. If you, if you get it taken care of right away, you don't have to maybe get a filling, maybe it just needs to get sealed, but it could get to a point where you have to get the tooth pulled. And if you don't know these things, it could be the, the cause of something else that's happening. You know, it's like, you ever have a back issue and it's actually your hamstrings that are too tight. Like it's really not what you're trying to address. It's something else. And, and finances is key. I, I remember I worked at one company and the, the bookkeeper was one of their good friends. And I'd, I'd walk in every week and have all these post-its everywhere. And I'd be like, that's not accounting what you're doing right now. That's just like trying to make ends meet. And then every two weeks come Thursday, they'd be like, well, we can't make payroll. 
It's like, that's not forecasting anything. That's reacting. And we wouldn't want to react on a job site, so why should we react financially? And it's one of the hardest things to really pull away from because it's like, number one and number two is, you know, production, execution, and client relationship. Those two things are what basically get the money to come in. And then it's then pulling away from that real quick and dialing in the finances and then going right back out to production and client relationship. And it's like this jump back and forth until it's you have the right people in place. But like my goal in 2021, besides obviously getting the company in, in, in order, it's like I want to give certain people certain things. Like I want to get Benny a certain salary uh, and it's where he should be. You know, and it's like giving certain people bonuses where it's like, or bumps. And then I'm like, ah, now I can, I can rest easy. Like the, everyone's where they need to be. I don't have to worry so much about that because that's one of those things that Nick, we talked, you said it earlier and I was trying to get a word and it's like, that's what keeps you up. Like, mm. yeah, you can ignore the finances and have someone else do it. You can try that for a couple months, but your mind's going to want to know where the numbers go. You know what I mean? You need to get that one call where it's a, a sub goes, I didn't, I didn't get that check. It's like, I invoiced for that two months ago. I wrecked for that. How'd that check not get to you? And right. then that basically plants that seed and it grows and it grows and it grows. And then you're like, what's going on in my life? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't have any, any control. And it's right. just because you, you've let go enough that if you freak out and that, that can kill your, your home relationship. And it's, you know, what a, a business, you can never let a business go, John. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to wreck your, wreck, wreck your dream there, but it's, it continually needs to be refined. So let's say you got all the perfect people into place, right? And you got all, everything is just running perfectly. You still need to keep an eye on things and still need to look to see what's going on and where the problems are because a system you put in place today will change by whoever's running it later on. They have a personal problem. They have something going on, but as a business owner, that's the best role to have, you know, to make the, but you're not making the big adjustments. You're not knocking things sideways all over the place. It's the, the cat analogy, you know, they're just, they're kind of bringing that mouse right in just nice and close. That's a great position to be in. And to touch back on the finances, that is the analytic of what's going on with the company. Uh, you have, you know, somebody who's running one job over on the right. He has a real high profit margin and everything's going great. You have a, a, somebody on the left. Okay, why is his job not, why, why, why are we losing money on this job and this one's going there? Well, it's rather than having to be on job sites every single day, take a look at it. You can look at the numbers and that'll give you a clear indication right there of what you need to look at. Agreed. John? I, I agree. I'm not saying I'm gonna let go. I don't think that John's No, gonna... no, I didn't, I didn't actually. I was, I was I, I just... making a funny within there, but it's it's a continual refine, yeah. let it flow. Refine, I feel like, I feel I feel like John's one of those people that says his goal is to let go of his company and it'll actually never happen like that's just what you've done your entire life and you have this it's like the grass is always greener type of thing we're like yeah hey, i'm gonna let go of everything in the company and then you'll finally make it happen and then you're like screw this i'm firing everyone going back to the way it was <laughs> no i guess I, like, I love Dude, the you would just oh man could you imagine what you would do in a day if like everyone else was doing anything, I think your head would explode. I'd give you like 37 minutes. No, I know. And but then you'd just be like. Pfft. Like we met with the boys on Friday last week because we turned the project over and I haven't been out a lot. And, and it was like, sat down with them and just said, hey, you know, super, didn't sit down. We were around an island cleaning up. Like we were all doing stuff. And I was just sit like, down, I'm super appreciative. You. But it's, it's more the fact that we talked about before is that I have always towed the line. And Benny actually pulled me aside and he actually texted me afterwards and apologized. And, and he's just like, he goes, you need to get like a, um, a second home. And I'm like, excuse me. He's like, you just need to step away and go enjoy yourself a little more. <laughs> Cause it's like, that's what the guys will look up to. Like Benny's like, again, second person said to me, he goes, if I 
am going to be successful and I do what you do and, and work yourself into a frizzy where you get sick, then that's really not success. And and he's right. And, and it's just, I feel like it's two and a half years in to the company and it's like I have, I feel like this need to be on top of everything just to make sure it's right and then slowly let go and slowly, and it's working. Like the right people we've hired, we've done it the right way and people are making these it's small adjustments, like you said, Wade, it is, it, it's in there improving steadily. And I love that where I, I can see, I think we've all been in business where you finally make two steps forward and get whacked six steps back. And now it's like, I want to make a couple little steps along the way. And then now I can see it like gradually taking that momentum's taking shape, meaning they're always improving. Yeah. And it can't just be knee-jerk reactions yeah. to everything you know it has to be like quantified and calculated and then put into place and then go through it again um i think that like the knee-jerk reactions while necessary aren't necessarily the direction that you want to be headed all the time but you know what's freaky is that like when you hire somebody and you start to delegate more stuff and some of the feedback you get from subs and even clients and vendors is like oh you know he's not gonna work you know, and it's like, all right, some of these guys are, I, I valued for years. Like my plaster, Diego, he's he's known me. I've said it. He knew me back when I, I, I built houses and I wore a tool belt. So like when he sees someone come in the mix, he gauges them. And then we usually have a one-on-one like a year in. And when ever it's not you running it, it's someone else. So it's going to have a different feel. It's going to have a different tone. Their text message might have more caps and less exclamation points than me. Like you, you never know what it's going to be. But it, I guess my point is, is like when you start to get over that hump, it's like you start to hear from clients like, oh, you know what? John's doing or whoever it is, is doing great. And it's like, all right, well, there's that huge doubt where you're investing time and effort into somebody that people don't see the same thing you do. You know, it's not the finances anymore, but it's it's that culture. Yeah. It's like, no, nah, man, I made the right call with this guy. He's going to, this guy, or girl, it's, it's going to turn. Trust me. It'll, it, so it's like getting that feedback. It's the same thing. It's so many people go through this where they don't look for that feedback. Guess what? He's running the jobs now. So you it's, change as a subcontractor, which kills your culture. But it's, it's good. No, I was just going to say it's, it's, it's interesting because it's also the other way around mm. where it's like the guy that's running the job is like, yeah, that, that guy, that, mm -hmm. that sub's not going to work. It's like, what, what do you, he's been my, he's been my dude. Yeah. He's been my dude since day one. Yeah. He just doesn't, he's got a bad attitude and he's not getting the work done. And you, then it's like, who is, yep, exactly. Am, am, am I wrong? Am I wrong with the sub or am I wrong with you? Or are you doing a bad job at managing and I did a better job? It's like, again, mm -hmm. John mm -hmm. staying up at night, like it's, it's this, it, it that's the hardest part of like, the let go of like putting people in place and then it's like okay well do you just let them bring in their own sub pool and it's like at that point it's like what is their value to that that's you know, pure chaos right like, and it's, it's like, like what do you i know, do you've developed yeah. this this pool of you know subcontractors and it's it's even part of like the pitch right it's like we yeah. work the same guys on every job they they have worked under you know with us as a team and they understand our approach Oh, not this job. My guy brought in a new guy. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> shit, I mean, like, is he going to, like, is this a... Benny, oh. when he came on our job way back in the day, we had our framer that framed everything, Pedro. I got a text from, from Pedro where he goes, Benny just threw me off the job. And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean he threw you off the job? Ben didn't like his tone and said, leave, go home for the day. And I was like, wait a minute. I love Benny. Peter's been with me for seven years. I'm like, right. so, like, I'm in this, so I have to, and then you go into this, like, all right, who said what first? how this happen? Everyone has, you know, value, and everyone has a point. It's like, when did it come off the tracks? And we always joke about that, because Pedro still works for us, and it's like, remember when Benny threw you off the job? But it's, it's one of those things that just, like, and, and that can really kill you if you're, financially strapped and then basically a job falls off the, the, the production line and then this happens where the day-to-day -day is dead. Like there's almost these three different balls that you're trying to keep momentum going on and you're trying to get to each one of them. Nick, it's like 17 for you. 
but it's like how do you once once one starts to fall you're like oh man and it makes it really tough when i think we've talked about it nick it's like how do you do it when it's all you where like i have benny where i can separate or have that sounding board i i don't, I don't want to say this rudely but like at the same level mm-hmm. you get me like it's like talking with my wife like well you guys are partners a, like, a, like they have the same authority as yeah. me and where i don't know how you do it where like i think maybe ken is probably close you know where you guys can talk about how the plan's going to be and all that stuff and and mike but like i don't know what i would do without benny you know like those dr- like drive home for two and a half hours mm-hmm. whatever I'll, we'll be sitting i'll be we'll both be sitting in our driveways <laughs> be like oh yeah i mean no, i what, don't what do you think i, I don't I don't have that. I know. So it, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have an answer for it. It's, it's, it's something I think I, I battle with. It's, you know, it, I, I deal with it on a daily basis. Both sides of it, you know, the, you know, hey, I don't like, I don't like this guy, you know, from the sub and from the PM, and it's like, all right, well, I, I gotta, I gotta work through this. Like, what, you know. I got to weigh the pros and cons. I got to look at it. Is it like, does it make sense? You know, is it job by job, case by case, PM by PM? You know, and I, th- I think we had someone on recently where the, it's like, I think, I don't know if it was on the podcast, but it, it they were they were basically talking about how they're structured and all their PMs basically hold their subs tight. Like they don't even share the subs across PMs. And yeah, it within was, the um, same company. It was Kevin that just said that. Everybody's talking about somebody else. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, it is a tough thing. The bigger you get, the more you are managing people and less events. Woof. Right? We have, um, I mean, we have a guy working <laughs> for us, Brendan, who's fantastic. And, but even, you know, it's, it's tough to be able to let go of those things and say, okay, I would have done it this way. Brendan did it another way. Inevitably, he ends up getting to the same goal line, you know, and that's, and, and then you're there more for advice and, and helping them along and answering questions and things like that. But it's, it is a tough one. I mean, it, you know, I look at things, okay, I'm going to do it this way, but he's doing it that way. Is it wrong what he's doing or is it going to work out? And usually if you find the right people, they may get there a different direction, but they'll they'll get there in the end. It's tough because sometimes you look at it that way, which is the nice way of looking at it. And then it's the other way of like, is that going to cost me money? Is that going to kill me? And then it's like estimating. Like you ever interview an estimator and you look at their resume and they've only been at a company for one year stints everywhere. So that's usually the time it takes for them to bid a job and realize they bid it wrong and then they get fired. <laughs> Go on to the next <laughs> so, job. Right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's like, how yeah. do you how do you give enough leash so they choke but yet they're not just running free and and causing a a muck you know where it's like you you never want to hold it too tight where they're you choke at them all the time but it's we used to say it all the time it's like i'm gonna give you enough leash that you're gonna choke yourself but it's on your time like i'm not just gonna keep pulling it where it's like dude this guy's just so micromanaging me um so it's tough and yeah you got to be able to trust the guy doing it because then ultimately they're representing you too, John, you know, they're out there and the brand, the company, the culture you're trying to set. And that's why, you know, you end up going through, you have the one guy, uh, Benny, I think you were mentioning he's worked for you for years, right? He's still there. Well, guess what? He fits. And just like subcontractors, I mean, this year in particular, we've had subs that were solid. Like these are the guys you didn't need to worry about, right? They're in there. They're taking care of business. They're having problems, and so you have to you have to look at them and say, look, it, you know, it's not working. You're not the same group you were. But with you know, and that again, different rabbit hole, different beer mm-hmm. <laughs> later on. But um, to find those key people and to trust them to do it is is, is a tough thing. But inevitably, that's the only way, you know, the, you can make a dollar yourself, right? Every day, go out and make a dollar. But if you want to make $2, you have to get other people involved to help make that, you know, that, that extra money up in, 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 in the company. And that means more people. Wait a minute. I'll do my own demo. And then I'll right. work till like 10 o'clock at night. And that will give me 250 right? 
And then every Friday afternoon, I'll sit there and try to do all my finances yep. as fast as I can for the next week. Yeah. <laughs> no, we've all been there. And close my eyes real quick, <laughs> bang it all out and be like, dude, we're great. We're dude, good. I remember, is out. I'm done. I, I, I think remember. I got everything. I think it's all finished. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the systems, procedures, and again, the reports and the analytics, uh, the gauges of your company. It's it, a car analogy. I mean, you, you look at the voltmeter for the for for the battery you look at the oil pressure it's all those are the things that are telling you the car is running or it's not running or it's going haywire the last thing you want to hear is a big bang coming out of the engine because you weren't looking at all those gauges wade and, yes sir. I, i'm going to interrupt you just real quick because every every podcast we have this bright idea that someone should go out and invent mm-hmm. and i think we just touched on it. i think what we need is a gauge cluster on Your our business desk for our business Gage plugs cluster. into like quickbooks and yeah. bill.com and whatever else and it's like you can look over at the tank and be like damn that thing's almost empty i better get some gas i'm redlining your, probably your <laughs> cell phone Yo, my, you know, my oil my custom, oil ta- my oil interaction and, and customer <laughs> happiness and all that thing is that's that's gauge. the oil it's pressure only- that's the oil pressure it's just yeah, funny because with no formal training process um to kind of step into our companies and it's there's no standard there that I feel like there has to be a pretty tight leash for a certain amount of time, John, yeah. um, where like, I, I don't think you should be afraid to hold on pretty tightly to that leash until you, you feel like it's time to start letting some slack out. Um, but I don't which, have that gauge. I guess, it's, uh, I guess yeah, I'm so I, I think it's it hard. It's, it was it's nice different to, with everyone. When I was forced to do it, it was nice to realize that it worked. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, the, it the, is for, your for company. That is customers. It's the ultimate gauge. Yeah. Uh, but, you mm-hmm. know, subcontractors, they get, we're, we're all, you know, we get mad at each other. Some, so I, I've literally broken up subcontractors from trying to beat each other, right? Really? Because they, it's only they, happened once for me in my I, entire career. Th- this month. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, they, they get on top of each other, they, they all have an agenda right of hey i want to show you how good i am i'm going to tell you this guy's bad it's it's a human nature thing we run into it all the time the thing for me is calling the customer up and never losing that customer interaction because because ultimately that customer picked the project and picked the company because of you that was that's the reason they came in in the first place and the first of all, they love the phone call, but second of all, Hey, how's, how's he doing? How, how is everything going? How's the project running? Well, you know, things have been really late lately. I mean, the customer is going to tell you exactly what's going on on the job. Um, that that's a very good gauge for that portion of the company. The other one is showing up at the job site, you know, is, is, is the job site all of a sudden in disarray and chaotic and crazy and subcontractors are beating each other up on the second floor, right? What's mm-hmm. going on? Um, the feel of what's going on and, and not announcing that you're coming, but just, you just go out there and do a quick little drive-by. And, and I agree with your, your comment, Tyler, is that at first, I mean, these people are hired to continue to represent the feel and the look and the and the quality and everything that your company brings forward. So you got to make sure they're doing that. Um, some people are great at acing an interview and terrible at the actual process. Yeah. Lies. Yeah. You yeah. lied yeah. to me. <laughs> you you, you did not tell that. me the so, truth that entire interview. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, it's uh, it's interesting. You talk about that. You know, the showing up randomly is. I love that. That's like you know, the, I think the best. Catch them right in the middle of what's going on, what they're thinking, and things like that. But recently, you t- you talk about having a pulse on the homeowner, and I've been working with uh, a coach, and that's something that we just recently implemented a couple months ago, where like some a formal process where mm-hmm. it was like more so more than just like hey, how's everything going, or you know. And what we've done, and I'm, I want to share it with everyone because it's, it's been really beneficial, is that we've actually built a survey, and it's literally a one question, how are we doing one through ten? That's it. Mm-hmm. And then we, we built it in Google, uh, Google Form, and I send it out every single month. 
and it goes out to every client and they fill it out. And if they don't fill it out, I follow up with an email like, hey, you know, can you just do me a quick favor? It's Here's the link. It actually goes right in the body of the email. Just let us know how we're doing. And that way we get a gauge. And, you know, it does two things. And, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing what my coach had, had, had talked about is that, number one, if they're going in there and clicking off 10, they have the option to leave a comment if they want. But if they're going on in there and clicking off 10 every month, because things are so good, it reminds them how well that project is going and how great the experience is. But the other side of it is if they're clicking nine, eight, or you know seven, we basically build a, have, have this threshold of eight. So if they hit eight, it's like sound the alarm, like what's going on, like we got to figure out, like just you know what that if they're if they're act you know going in there and saying all right, they're two points below like where they should be. You know, we want to, I, I reach out, hey, what's going on? Like, okay, just like you said, well, things have been a little late. Communication's been lacking. We can correct it right then and there. Because I feel like so many times, you know, you get the review at the end of the job. You get feedback at the end of the job. You might have these casual touch points throughout the job, but they're never, you know, a periodic thing where you're getting constant feedback over and over and doing that has been it's just been it's been great and what it does and the other thing that the third thing i guess would be it's keeping these you know everyone in tune with what's going on the project managers know i i gotta be better about communicating like this client really wants to be communicated to every day every week you know they're expecting this from us like they're getting that feedback so they can adapt and keep that client satisfaction high and you know you know what? I, I struggle with that, Nick. It, it's and I'm not taking anything away from you, or you coach. I just feel like it's the same as like if you were to call my company line and it's like dial one to get John, dial two to get Ben. Like I want it to be an intimate experience the whole time. So it's the same as like take it to like do you send it to all your employees to see how they're doing every month? Like it, it's. Like we want to have a pulse on the job and and the individuals and the culture that that you created. Mm-hmm. That send the survey. Is it going to give you real data? Where it, it's like Wade, you said like when you talked to a client about a, a PM. I found over the years, most clients love the PM. They 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 that's their friend. That's their buddy through this whole thing. So to get an authentic view, if it's going really bad you'll get something from them. Sure. But most yeah. of the time, they'll actually have that PMS back, and then they'll be like, hey, can you look in the budget? Because this isn't shaken out right because you wrote the budget. And it's that you're too far, you've disconnected yourself from that job. I so, I, I agree, and, but I, and I'm, I don't want to take away the intimate part of it, but there is there is something to say about removing, so, like me asking the question. You know, no, I'm, me not, I'm ha- not, that's, uh, you've missed it. It's knowing it. It's feeling of, it. It's like it's like sending course, my wife that, a survey every month to see how we're doing. <laughs> like, I want to sure. know what's going down. I feel like I could do that sometimes. <laughs> I haven't seen her in like two days. I, I I don't disagree, and I and I still I'm not utilize, I'm not using that to to maintain the pulse. It's just this reoccurring, like making sure that the clients reminded out how well it's going. It's more, it's, it, it's ideally it's more for that, for the client to remember how well things are going. It's like, Hey, he's, but like, he's so check- what happens it, and again, sure. devil's advocate, like six months into the project and the last five months have been tens. And then the project ends that month and they go, this sucked. You're going to go, Hey, but you filled out these surveys. No, not at all. It said 10. I just, I'm trying to understand where like my guy, John, I just gave him a bump. Like we didn't do a formal review. I didn't send him a survey. I didn't, I wanted, like, I got feedback from Ben that, hey, he had a great client meeting, blah, blah. And it was like, you know what? I know he doesn't have finances down. And I know he doesn't have scheduling down. That's what we're going to work on next. But it's like, he's made it. And I, I said to him, I go, there will never be a time where you need to ask me for a raise. Mm-hmm. And it's like, same thing. It's like my new guy who just hired. I'm like, I'm going to work on getting you a laptop. He didn't want one. He got one from school. I'm like, we're going to shake it out next week because you're taking on way more with emails and all that stuff because I, I this is the separation part that Tyler was saying like be I want to know how everything goes and that will probably be my downfall for my health and my mind is that I want to be in the mix with everybody and I, I, I keep it intimate 
like, you, and, and you and, still and can understand do that. Where, where it goes with all the clients. You and I, you can still do that. And I, and I, I don't think you lose that. I think the creating that process, at least for me, it's giving it's, it's measurable. It's making sure that the PM knows how the client thinks he's doing. It's getting like it's it's putting it's it's actually there. So it's like if we have to adapt or, or or you know make changes, client communication is, in my opinion, the biggest issue our industry faces is the communication to the client in one way or the other. And you know, and I've and I've spent a lot of time digging into that and figuring out how do we improve that. And, and and testing these things where it's like, all right, if we if we communicate this way, how successful is that, and how well does the client, you know, feel about that? And that's you know, and doing this, yeah, it's it's it is. It's a survey and an email that they click a, a button and they're it's done. And maybe they do. Maybe they go through the whole job and hit tens because they're just they they don't want to deal with it. The, the likelihood is if if they're gonna do that, they're just not gonna fill it out at all. But if they go that and then they say it sucks at the end, well, okay. I mean, then, yeah, that's, I guess it's null and void, but at least, you know, it, for our, for for the sake of, you know, being able to measure how we're doing throughout the job, you know, beyond the intimate part is, and having that gauge is like, that's, that's the tool we're using. And I'm with you. I just, to me, I feel like it totally makes sense for you. Keep doing it. Um, just, <laughs> I, no, it's, listen, it's, I'm it's not going to, you know, <laughs> If I could jump in here, uh, I think both approaches are correct. It just depends upon the company. And this is what I touched on way. earlier about, you know, you, you've got to make the company yours. You have to develop the company for what you want and the way you want it. I think both both approaches are correct. It just depends on, on the scale of your company and, and what you want to do. I think Nick, you're saying it doesn't have to be; they don't have to be independent of each other as well, right? I'm just worried it gives you a false sense of reassurance, dude. That's that all you, that matters. That just that gives you confidence, and you go from there. Who cares? But, yeah. really yeah. not. <laughs> but then, you, then that's all maybe, you need, man. It's just about confidence. You should but, know that at this point. But I feel like but, but you're selling not, more now. What if it's you not got a little swagger it, in your step? You don't care about the vertigo. But John, what like it's what if it's not as false? The safety guy. The same concern I had there is I, that it, but it's what if it's dilutes not the false? focus for people to actually look at it when the it, and I guess again, I don't know your company well enough, Nick, to, to know what like I, I walked on a job site today and I was like, There's a guy putting up staging and I'm like, he needs protect he needs fall protection on right sure. now. Like and I, I said it to him to my guy and he's just like, Yeah. And I'm like, Okay. I walked over to the guy. I was like, you got to get off of that. You're too valuable to me and, and to anybody in your family to take that risk. So I'll bring in two harnesses tomorrow. And he goes, I have one. I'm like, you're not wearing it now. So like, I'm going to bring one in tomorrow. So that way we've eliminated this communication issue that you're not wearing it. And it's like, to me, it's like having a safety guy. And, and again, not, I would be worried that now this person I have on my site isn't going to be diligent because that's not in their realm. And I get it. It's not what it is, Nick. It's my worry. And sure. again, my worry is something that keeps that's me up fair, at night is those little things. Yeah, I that get it. It's fair. I, I got all those surveys and I'm like, oh, we're, we're doing good. And then you'll get sucker punched. And I think it's anything, whether it's safety, finances, client relationships, I'm always looking for that sucker punch. When someone goes, hey, you know, the job's going great. I'm like, can you kill the CEO? talk and just tell me the, what the butt is is this about like the just, podcast survey <laughs> I'm actually <totally laughs> is this about the itunes survey <laughs> i guess i guess i'm just always worried about that false sense of i mean i think you can get the fall reassurance that it's on a bias that but that's know. that's the point of not separating them you're not relying on them it's i think you can get sucker punch not doing the surveys and getting a false sense of the project going good intimately you know, the, in, the intimacy side of it doesn't go away. You're getting the, you know, the, the survey to, to hopefully back it up. So like, yeah, th there's the, ca there's the, the case that maybe it's all bullshit and it, uh, it, it is this false sense of security, but there's also the, the, the case that maybe it's not, maybe it's helpful to the situation and it actually does, you know, there is a positive outcome to it, which again, it's, I think it's with anything. It's the, you know, I, I think that, 
I'm not saying it's right nor wrong. What I'm saying is it wor- it's been working for us and it's helped us correct a lot of the the communication. I don't even want to say issues, but like the 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 communication, uh, the lack of communication in, in certain areas, and and helped us develop processes in which the client always feels like they're in tune, and we've eliminate we've basically eliminated the 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 one the ones or two you know questions because like the the text message like hey you know but whatever it like whatever it is i don't need to put an example but eliminating like the nuances of text messages or emails because the client's asking where we should they should already have that information like hey when is so and so like coming back to 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 finish this it's like they should already know that they should like we uh, in my eyes, the client shouldn't be reaching out and asking, hey, when is this going to get done? I agree. Mike, Mike. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't disagree with you. No, I don't it, think it, that, I don't think that, I think that both of you have valid points. I don't think one should be independent of the other. I also like, I do like giving a customer or a client an opportunity to give you an unbiased opinion without you being there like i think i don't know we can some people can gauge how things are going better than others some people have a false sense of how things are going like i've i've walked into a job before with a designer where it was like pre-construction she's telling me how much the customers love them and i leave the me i leave the meeting and i'm like they do not love her at all. And like, she thinks that they love them. Um, so like being able to reach out to customers and just getting an unbiased opinion, I think sometimes customers will, or people in general will give you one or say one thing in person, um, because they either don't want to disappoint you or they don't really have thick enough skin to give you their honest opinion um and it might give them an outlet to kind of convey some of their concerns even if it's just a number rating it 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 depends upon the client i mean all all these things you know systems and procedures have to be adaptable to the individual client right like i mean nick you may you may have somebody that's you know says hey call me when the project's done right (laughs) <laughs> or you have other ones that say, show up on the job site every single day and say, Hey, what's this? What's that? What's this? What's that? Um, and, and I, I like the, the monthly survey thing. I think it's a good overview, um, quick gauge. And I really like phone calls. Um, what I found is, you know, when I call a client up, say, Hey, how's it going? First thing out of their mouth. Great. As, as you pointed out, I think, Nick, early, you know, you would hear about it before if there was a big problem. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we get married to clients for a while. That's always my joke with them. As I said, look, we're going to get married for a while. We're going to have some good times. We're going to have some not good times, but we'll get through it. And we'll, it'll, in the end, you're going to have a fantastic product. But what I found is in the phone calls, the first couple minutes are great. They're details or details. And then you start digging in and then you find out a real thing, you know, and there's the, the, the survey works. You get an overview. You do have something to fall back upon where you could say, Hey, in June, you said it was awesome. You said we were awesome. What's it, what's happened between here and there. But that phone call is, is, is great. Some of the best conversations I've ever had with clients is after all the subs have gone home and you're there on the job site or you're there at their house or it's the, the, the noise and the chaos is gone and then you get the real story. I mean, that's any happening. conversation with anyone, right? You have to kind of break down that, that wall, that facade that they have up and then get down to actually what's going on unless there's an overwhelming... Um, good or bad experience I feel like it takes a little bit of conversation for them to really get into how their experience is unless like I said they're super pissed or just super excited about something you got to put in an effort to kind of start squeezing some of that stuff out of them well you also have to curb the conversation so you are vulnerable Mm. yeah you're opening it up where it's it's not like hey schedules looking good because anyone can Kind yeah, you're like take, manipulating it at yeah, that point. You, you got to be honest and, and kind of push it where it's like, 
you know, let your guard down a little bit and go, hey, we're two humans. You know, I'm not just running a job for you. Right. It's like, what do you think's happening? But you're right. Some of the best, I, we've become friends with a lot of our clients. And it sounds crazy, but it's like, you, you're, I, I, I talk with some of my clients more than I talk to with my wife. And it's like, it, it's crazy that you have these these conversations all the time and blah, blah, blah. And you find you end up influencing more of how they're going to live going forward with their family in a home that you're renovating and building. And that's that's huge. You understand their little moments. And I think it's for me, and it's going to be very hard, Nick, for for me to have more PMs run our stuff and me be able to still have a pulse on that where, you know, they pause for a minute or I follow their eyes. Like maybe they looked at something too long and then I'll stand in the exact same spot they were and try and figure out what is it they're right. looking at for that extra 15 seconds. And how do I know that the guy and the girl that, that take on that PM role will do that, that will look for that moment where they pause or they, they didn't give you the answer. It was like, hey, it was fine. It's like, yeah, if I was at home, I'd be like, babe, what's fine? That word means nothing to me. So I say that to the client. <laughs> like, you know, what's the deal? Like, fine. I'm not looking for fine. I'm looking for excitement. You know, all day, it's like it's being in battle. Like, the smell of sawdust and the dirt flying and excavators rolling. This is like my battlefield. And then when it all shuts down, it's like, what do you think? How do we do? Like, be honest with me. Don't bullshit me. You know, laid on the line. We put too much effort into these products for you to sugarcoat the situation at any given time. So, to me, it's like if if I get a survey back, and it's like a, a, a I don't know six. Like, how do you gauge it? What's ten? Is ten like perfect? Like, how do you rate what through the scale? Ten? Why not do one through five? Like, what's what what got know. you to one to ten? I feel like that's just a standard a average, one to yeah, ten. Yeah, standard. No, I'm just, I'm just at like, yeah. it's like I feel like the whole middle area is like between four and seven I mean, is like, oh, it's the same thing. In my eyes, anything <laughs> below an eight, like that's just but eight, eight and below. to ten is the same thing. I, I guess my my thing is like, I don't know what I would be worried about. Like, if I got something back, I would look into everything, unless it was ten. Sure. Like, but that's the point. You freak then me you, out. Then you then you make a call. Like, hey, what's going on? Like. You know, if you're saying nine, it's like, yeah, I'm still going to make that call. So you're saying We're, nine closer to 10 or nine closer to eight? <laughs> Can they do points? <laughs> no, it's not a pizza score. Point five. It's a big, but it's, it's a but it's, spread. Nine no, it's it, it, nine. It's like, all right, hey, what's going on? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything's good. It's just like we're a little bit behind schedule. I was hoping to be in soon. All right, cool. Eight. It's like, hey, what's going on? Like you, you know, well, you know, that, that you, in my opinion, psychologically once you hit eight and below it's like there's a bigger issue that is starting like it's just going to start trickling down if it's not addressed no, where right. it's like you know and that it, i don't know i don't even I'm know learning. why we give kids report cards you know what's that i feel like it's a report card yeah right you well, don't love them do any less you don't love them any less they do sati- like no, all satisfactory stuff, no? yeah it's like satisfaction <laughs> close enough yeah you know what i meant wait I, I i wanted to dig into your coaching but i feel like we've touched on it pretty much this entire podcast and no <laughs> I, I i legit had a question on that too like like i feel like myself failing the first time when i shut my company down to go get a real job as a pm and all that stuff it wipes out any ability for me to give advice it's my hardest thing about giving advice is that i have failed before and that mm-hmm. was what i wrote down right in the beginning of this conversation is that you not only I've been doing this for 24 years or whatever. And I've been, since I failed at my first one, it's been whatever I had to pay back $30,000 in debt to a lumber yard. And it's, it's like, I don't, that, that, that still haunts me that I know I can teach people from that mistake, but should I? Yeah. Like, you know, the, me the ability? For, for me and, and I, I understand what your point is. It's, you you either win or you learn. That's it. You know, everybody makes mistakes. You touched it on the point, John. You said, hey, we're all, you know, we're human. Everybody's human. Uh, but the, those things, you know, the you win or you learn. And to be able to give other people advice and to help them out, I've been doing this a long time, you know, and I've had successes more than I've had not successes, but I've learned more than not successes. 
and they've shaped me more than the wins. Like I said, when things are going easy, things are cruising along, uh, it's no big deal. You don't learn much while it's going there. At the, at the same time, I've put a lot of thought into it. It's like anything else. If you decided you wanted to be, you know, the world's best airplane mechanic and you started tomorrow and you start thinking about being an airplane mechanic and you keep going and keep going, you end up being a good airplane mechanic. You know, I put a lot of thought into the coaching, a lot of thought into things that people say um, and what the real issue is with the company. So I don't see the, I don't see any losses, um, you know, I've never declared bankruptcy or anything like that. So it's, I've always gotten back up my feet. You keep going and you keep moving. Is that, is that the question you were going for, John, there? Uh, yeah, I guess with today, like we talked about how, you know, no one's going to get caught because the, the tide hasn't gone out, that there's so many people that are successful because the market's been so good that why would they listen to someone that's failed? Is that's, that's where I get hung up and it's like, you know what? And it haunts me all the time. It's like, you know what? There's so-and-so that does this better than me. And is that imposter syndrome that I get where it's like, you know, like look at Nick. Nick five years in is like, I had this guy on the phone this week called me and he's like, I want to get into pushing the, the, the craft and, and this stuff. And I was like, who who are you? How'd you get my number? And he's on the phone with me and he's just <laughs> like, yeah, I want to tell kids that, you know, by the time you're 40, you can be a millionaire in this industry. And I'm like, Yo, I'm 41, and I've been busting my ass at this goddamn thing every day of the week for so long, and I'm not a millionaire. And it's like those little reality checks that really, like, I won't post anything on social media for, like, <laughs> two weeks because I'm like, oh, I can't get over this. And some days I go to the podcast, and I'm like, why am I getting on a podcast with two other people and a guest that are better at business than me? And I, I get hung up on that so often like every time yeah. I, I listen to podcasts today and tyler's like he said something about you know his, his clients and relations i'm like i don't give that much i want to i just ca i can't give as much as he's doing but, but it's it's, so it's, hard it's, i don't feel like it, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to what i'm doing either because it's it's not the same it's not apples to apples what you have to compare what you're doing today versus what you're doing tomorrow versus what you did in the past because that's your only real gauge of comparison you know you don't have the same customers it's not the same demographic it's not the same geographic location it's not the same scale scope it, it, there's nothing that you can compare your business to what i'm doing that would be fair or even really beneficial to you um I don't think it would be constructive in the least. I feel like you, you, the comparisons that you need to be making are, you know, past, present, and future for your business. That's ex exactly the point I was going to go on to, Tyler. Sorry. Exactly. No, no, that's it. it, it I'll elaborate on it. As, as a coach and a consultant, for me coming into a company, you know, I can't tell, you know, Nick, John, Tyler, this is what you need to do to fix your company. Okay. What I need to do is get you and bring the things out in you that you already know, or you haven't seen yet to get your company going. I mean, these, the, the, the survey is a perfect example. That works great for you, Nick. I can see the way, you know, the little I know about your company and our conversations, I can see that that is a good thing. John, I would see a, a survey would not work for you within your company. I'm doing it tomorrow. So, so. It's impressive yeah, yeah, that you yeah, were able exactly. to pull that out of it's, this conversation. And you're going to steal Nick's too. So <laughs> steal, steal Nick's I'll and then throw it. it out there. But, you know, when I go in and I start talking to people and getting to know their company, like I said, some of the basic things are very fundamental and they're easy to fix. The fundamentals, you know, the finances, your marketing, your budgets, the way you're estimating, those sort of things. But really the point to where it starts to work is when the clients and I on a coaching level are seeing things in the same way. I'm getting what he's going for and what he wants to have ultimately. And that's where the guidance really starts to kick in and it really starts to move. And sometimes it's, you know, it's not individuals, it's the overall, you know, it's a little larger corporation where, 
there's basically CEOs and things like that. And, but the individual departments, we develop that sort of repertoire to where, you know, you can pull out what needs to be done and needs to be fixed. So it's a twofold in there. So again, my goal, if I walked right in, I said, oh, John, she's, you don't know shit. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. It. Well, guess what? We'd be doing it my way. We wouldn't be doing it your way. But if we work together to figure out what is actually, what are the things that are getting you? How do we make it work for your goals today and your goals tomorrow? That's, that's what a coach and that's what a, a consultant really needs to be doing. Yeah, I feel so. like a good coach or a good consultant like John, you've had issues in the past with people being business coaches where it's just they preach the same thing to everyone and it's just across the board. You know, they have like their taglines and their go-tos and they're just like pushing and enforcing their will on every business. And I think that it's it's not that simple. The, the capacity for somebody to be able to gauge all of these different businesses and then help each individual business grow and maintain and sustain I think is is way harder than putting blanket statements across the board where this is what everyone needs to do charge more charge for estimates you know sell high um I think that it, 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 there's a lot more to it than that and each each company and each contractor is going to be completely independent of the other Exactly right So wait who needs your help the most like is it sole of proprietors? the three of us Oh, oh yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> that would have been awesome. I, I wanted to go on this podcast and be like, uh, for a friend, uh, five person company, what would be your suggestion? <laughs> you know, it's um, in in in, in a, a coach is invaluable. I mean, you could be the world's best athlete; they all have coaches, mm-hmm. right? It's we, we all, we all love our wives and we go home. But as soon as I bring up a problem to my wife, the first thing she wants to do is fight them. She's like, well, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Do that. And unbiased friendly has nothing but your success in mind is invaluable. A lot of the times what I find is somebody will bring up something to me and before they've even finished the bulk majority of what they're bringing up, they've kind of figured out, Oh, that's what the problem is but the the act of doing it and again this is beyond the fundamentals there's fundamentals within the construction business you got to do this you know you can't don't work for free you know you got to make sure there's money in there for your company you got to make sure you're you know looking at your insurance and getting the lowest insurance you can always Um, but it's when it gets to that next level we get past those fundamentals it's that somebody who's been there, somebody who's done it, somebody who does it. I mean, there's a reason why I still, you know, do the construction still is out there, still is working. And you know, is, is there to help has no other reason there to be there and help. So I think it's also what I'm gathering from that is also almost having like a mentor, you know, someone that's like, that you can bounce Absolutely. stuff off of. That's not your wife, not your coworker that, that you're, you're able to, you know, again, have that unbiased, but also someone else that's going to, it's almost like telling somebody, that's like when I have a four hour conversation with Ben, it's like, by the end of it, I'm just like, ah, oh, I felt good. You know, yeah, just yeah, having get it, it out. Yep. Yeah. And it's in non-emotional because mm-hmm. one of the biggest things is emotion clouds our judgment, right? If you're pissed about something, you're not seeing it necessarily clearly. And if there's an actual, like what I, what I call, you know, um, uh, an emergency phone call. Right. So I, ha- I have a program that I go through and it's six months and we go through the details and we kind of build up into this, you know, level to where we we have things under control in theory. Right. But it's those emergency phone calls of, hey, this happened, that happened, this happened. I, I, a coach doesn't have an emotional attachment to that situation. They didn't get yelled at the client didn't get yelled at, you know, they're not mad at because the guy didn't show up for work two days before and now has this other problem. So they're actually, you know, you're really mad about that, right? Because Pedro didn't show up last week and all of a sudden now he's having another problem and you're ticked. It's because be Benny able, threw him off the job. Exactly right. <laughs> he deserved it. So it's to be able to come in and just listen and, and, and subjectively look at it 
And if, you know, if it's an in-person thing, you know, I've been known to go out to job sites and just kind of go check things out, see what's going on. But it doesn't have to be. Um, you can look at it non-emotionally and with a solution. What is the best solution in mind? I dig it. I feel like you take all this stuff personally, John. I take everything personal. I know. You sit That's here why an old boss like, told me not to take things personal. Like, can, you, can you imagine if Nick took everything that we said to him personally? Yeah. I do. I just don't show it. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he goes home shut, and has to have a little cry. Little cry afterwards. Meg's like, how was the podcast? I'm like, terrible. <laughs> I'm, que- I'm questioning everything. My, I don't know why. Maybe because my wife knows... Uh, chase but she's like yeah listen to the one with chase you guys were busting nick's balls and i was like yeah i feel like we kind of do that every episode <laughs> it's like uh oh, sorry nick i appreciate it guys yeah we yeah. appreciate you coming on and hanging out so late hey, it was a good time i enjoyed it i enjoyed it anytime uh, yeah it was nice i didn't uh i didn't know the direction that this was going to go i'm uh i'm glad that it it kind of progressed how it did it was nice to not get on and just like it could have very easily been, hey, let's preach how we coach business yeah. or coach contractors and all of that stuff. And I think it, it was a it was a good conversation that'll be useful to people that's not just like getting on and listening to a lecture. Yeah, I was I was worried it's gonna be like a promotional thing. Like, this is what we do. This is how we solve that. Man, you guys were worried. <laughs> like, I, w- oh I was all amped up. I was like, I can't wait to chat, not be promotional. Right? Yeah, Rabbit is holes is yeah. what we do. Yep. No, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. So gentlemen, thank you. Yeah. Good luck with the fires. Hopefully that, uh, yeah. yeah, Appreciate it. Sorts out soon. Appreciate it. Hopefully they'll go out. We need a little bit of snow. Yeah. To go. So wait, before you do sign off, if someone is interested in, uh, connecting with you, what's the best way to do so? Uh, website, Wade, C I C.com. Awesome. And, uh, also on LinkedIn as well. And so Wade, hold on. We had that one question. Yep. Is, yep. What would you, what would you have told yourself, your younger self that you know now that would have helped you? There's a potential for the bubble to burst and don't over leverage. Very simple. It was very simple. You know, at that point it was, uh, the sky was the limit and there was absolutely no signs of anything. Although when, you know, all the guys who were investing in home loans pulled all their money out about three months before the crash, <laughs> nah. you know, pretty, <laughs> there's just something else maybe, out there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe amazing how that worked out well for them and not everybody else. But yeah, I mean, stability in the long run, if you're in this business for the long term, and you know, this, there's nothing the stability can't help with. And, uh, that, that's what I would have told myself. Wise words. Well said. Wait. Thank you, sir. All Be right, well, gentlemen. Man. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. You too. We'll see you. Well, look at that picture. Doesn't look we got a review. Oh, I heard your comment about my picture. That <laughs> is a <laughs> fantastic I like, picture. I feel like I feel like I saw that in the beginning, and yeah, then you it, came on. And was, I was like, was wait, there. I just so, remembered that picture, though. I feel like I just got yeah. catfished. Thank you, thank you for that. I'll, I'll give it to you again, <laughs> gentlemen. Have a good night. Thank thank you you. too, man. Be well. <laughs> look at that. He just shuts I need video. a picture like that. That was awesome that he came, he came, he came back. back. He was like, hold on, I got this. I, re- I don't know when I first logged on. Like, I don't know if he was not on yet, but I completely forgot that that picture was up. Or maybe it was just because I was logging on, like hadn't started my... Um, yeah, he wasn't But I was video. just like, I, I didn't put two and two yet. together. But even seeing that now, I'm like, that's not him. That's, uh, it looks like him, no? Yeah, I feel oh, like it's just awesome. like a very groomed styled picture that's what i that's what a headshot is man i guess so it's like the one i always send ryan mulkeen his headshot <laughs> for like when he, he got some done and i'll just send it over to him guys we're slacking on the uh reviews on itunes are we but we had a good we had a good download day didn't we uh yeah we did record breaking <laughs> i wonder what the final tally was did we lose uh, nick oh. no i mean i'm here no you're just a little quiet for some reason. Yeah. yeah. I think you need to be oh. up on that mic. Uh, I'm touching the mic with my mustache. Eight, You're better now. We need 800 reviews. How many How many do we have? 700 and I'm guessing right now. Tell me I'm wrong. Please. Tell, 747. You're wrong. Oh. 65. 65? 
Yeah, seven sixty five. That's good. So we're not I, too far. And off. I can't remember if I read this review last week. It was hell of a pod, super organic conversations with some pretty rad people in the building yeah, yeah, industry. Yeah, did. All right, thanks yeah. for stopping me. We got six more reviews on the uh, Survey Monkey. Survey Monkey. Uh, you guys got Frank, so now they want Kruger Construction. Uh, North Cal Framer, MGM Builders, Unity Homes. Ellie the Apprentice, which I think Nick, you already have, right? Yeah, she wants to do it live, which I'm yeah. not sure how that's going to happen, but maybe she'll. Uh, I'll reach back out to her see if she'd be up for it. Yeah. So there's a bunch of people that I haven't reached out to, which I will. How are we doing with uh, Mike Holmes? I mean, not Mike Holmes. <laughs> Mike. <God. laughs> he said Mike Holmes earlier. He's his definitely partner. not coming on now. <laughs> he did say his partner. I think is Mike yeah. Holmes, right? Uh, or Mike Holm. Uh, yeah. Not Mike Holm. Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe. I. I I may have just I'm destroyed that. I'm almost that. getting worried that he's reaching out to, on a platform that we don't have contact to. Because I feel like I've get I've probably gotten 25 more screenshots of people hitting them up. And I'm like, oh, man, if he's reaching out, we're not responding. So I've like keep re- refreshing my emails and stuff so for okay. info. <laughs> like, you get me? Like, I don't want to be like, oh, it's been in our... Like Tyler yeah. said something about his uh, a permit last week. Before I got yeah, in the it podcast, was in junk and mail. Like, yeah, junk. I'm like, is that where it is? That, you know dude, he's got one point one million followers. There's no way he's checking DMs. You need to start writing on every post of his. I think we need to go like even he has a podcast. We need to go on like on his iTunes. Oh and almost yeah, put it on his wall to be like, yo, what's the deal? Like we need to definitely. I think you guys also Facebook. We need to find some other avenues to to dial it in. Yeah. All right. Well, if anyone has ideas, reach out. If you guys want to fill out that survey for Survey Monkey, it is in our link tree on our Instagram, the period modern craftsman. If you want to drop us a review, we, if we're doing good, drop us a review on iTunes. Give us that, those five stars. Get us up to eight hundred. Uh, we're gonna be doing some new swag coming up, right? Yeah, Upstate's working on it right now. Dang, that's gonna be sick. Uh, you guys didn't respond. Do you guys like that? The mix of the two. I responded. For- yeah. yeah I- well, I didn't hear from Nick. Oh, maybe I didn't respond. When I don't hear from Nick, it's like, oh, well, that was a fail. Well, no, I had I, 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 <laughs> I was, uh, I took the weekend off. I, we were up in the cabin for our anniversary, so. Oh, uh, happy anniversary. Like, hey, should, oh yeah, happy anniversary. Should we do a recap from last week? Like, I uh, I actually put, I replaced the decking on the rotted porch. Um, did you? What else wait, What else did we touch on last you week? You didn't frame the deck? It. You didn't reframe? Yeah, I, re- I had to reframe it. Yeah. And then put. I told you guys it was like went from like one piece and then I also did the uh my copper water lines swap nice. those out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you sent those photos. That was awesome. It was easy. <laughs> it was easy. But then uh, you didn't you guys have anything? I thought there was I, stuff that you guys had. I think I was gonna week. do stuff at the cabin and I just we didn't we just chilled because we didn't have the kids. Oh really? Oh cool. you yeah. didn't take the kids with you? No, nah, my mom watched them so Damn, you're about to have another baby, huh? Seriously. Well, I mean, in January, yeah. Oh, you can't get more pregnant. <laughs> I don't no, think, not that I know of. <laughs> that would be crazy. Yeah, like, right. Oh, we just found out she's more pregnant. <laughs> yeah, she's having one in January and May. <laughs> <laughs> Layered. That would be weird, man. <laughs> Layered. That's babies. crazy. Um, that's nice though. How was that? It was good. You guys we- like had no idea what to do with each other. We went on a hike, and then the next morning, I was like, you want to go on another hike? She goes, nope. I'm like, <laughs> she's like, let's go to Walmart and get a heated blanket and just chill. It's funny, because like if, even if we go out to dinner without the girls, it's all we want. And then we get there, and we're like, I wonder how the girls are doing. What do you think they're yeah. doing right now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then and you get like, home, you're like, the kids? I'm like, I do, but. <laughs> uh, that was good. How far is that from your house? Hour and 50. Oh, that's, that's not bad. bad. No, it's nice. I want to get Stowe. I like oh, Stowe. Stowe's awesome. We gotta put we gotta put heat in it. We're gonna put a little mini split in that place. So super heat. What um yeah is everything starting to turn up there? Oh yeah, yeah. That's like nice. super fast. Yeah, I want to like get the girls in the car and either head up to the lake or something with them. Yeah, I feel like it's mm-hmm. nice. We're, I was gonna take them apple picking this weekend, but Doug. Uh, in the office today, he he posted something. He went apple picking, and I asked how was it. And he said it was like going to a football game. There was ten thousand people walking through the orchard. That's crazy. I was like, 
F that. Yeah, I'm sure that all of that stuff, like the yeah. outdoor fall stuff, is probably slammed right now. Wild. You just got to, like, sneak onto somebody's farm and take photos. Her, yeah, get her, you shot. <laughs> her, take photos. Take no, don't even get apples. Be fine. <laughs> just take photos. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Duration Molding and Millwork. Find yourself chasing rot on a few of your projects. And that <laughs> problem for... for <laughs> Did John write this? No, I didn't. I didn't read no, it. No, but I think they pay attention. <laughs> and that problem forever by replacing moldings and sidings with duration available in virtually any profile in order to match existing conditions or to just make a statement. Let's make the neighbors jealous. To learn more about duration polyash products, please visit their all new website, durationmillwork.com.